now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Seven o'clock. The coyotes are howling on the ridge, and it means, once again, it is time for a view from the bunker. This is a recording. Yes, we've returned from from our our trip to the Holy Land and to the U.K., but uh, as you are hearing this, it is uh, Father's Day weekend, so happy Father's Day to you out there if you are so blessed as I have been. Uh, So this is another Best Up program as we dig back into the archives. This week we talk about why they hate us. We're specifically referring to the Islamic world. A couple of experts on the history and the eschatology of Islam as we dig back into the archives for a little more insight as to uh, what we've done wrong or have we, in fact, done anything wrong. That's what this program is about, digging a little deeper. I'm Derek Gilbert. Thank you for joining us tonight, regardless of where or when you're listening. If you're listening live, it's Spreaker.com or through the website at VFTB.net. We thank you. I thank you for that. But uh, you can also listen many other ways. Uh, That would be iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spotify.com, or you can just subscribe to the podcast, which makes sure that you never miss an episode. Download it directly to your smartphone, tablet, or MP3 player of choice, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or just go to the website VFTB.net where you'll find links to subscribe very easily with a single click. Of course, you can also just download the free mobile app because if, after all, it is mobile and it's free, and of course, that way you've always got the program with you, you can dig into, uh, well, it's going on 10 years of archives now, which is why we've got so many uh, good interviews to bring back from the past when uh, we run into weekends where we're going to be busy and uh, just keep up with this weekly program. And we'll be doing that more as we get into the summer months, because as we'll tell you at the end of the program, we got a number of conferences. In fact, another one just added uh, to the schedule, it looks like, uh, this week. So uh, we'll have got that all coming up. And you'll find all those uh, scheduled, or all of those on the calendar at vftb.net, as well as all the archives going back to 2009. We also post the uh, the audio from these to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert, where you also find whatever videos I happen to put up there. Uh, I have not been doing many lately, but you'll also get the audio there from the weekly Bible study that Sharon and I produce, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Uh, we uh, began that just about five years ago, a little less than five years ago, and we are now, we've circled back around through the Bible, and we're starting again with Genesis 1, this time with a fresh set of eyes, because we've learned a few things over the last five years, so hopefully We'll incorporate that. If this week is any indication, it's going to take us more than five years to get back through the Bible because uh, last year we got two full chapters done in the very first, uh, the very first Gilbert House Fellowship. Today we only made through the first nineteen verses of chapter one of Genesis. So again, if that's any indication, it's going to be a slower go. But uh, that just means we're getting more stuff out. Well, the topic this week: Islam and what is it they want? Why do they seem to dislike us so much? And I think on a deeper level, why have Western politicians and military minds in the 20th and 21st centuries been so, found it so difficult to grasp exactly what the problem is? I mean, if we treat them more nicely, won't they respond in kind? Well, actually, no. No, that happens not to be the case. First, we go back to 2015 for an interview with an expert whose um, PhD, in fact, is in Islamic history with an emphasis on Islamic eschatology. He's the author of several books that we recommend, including 10 Years Captivation with the Mahdi's Camps. Uh, That's uh, a series of essays on Islamic eschatology. And Sects, Lies, and the Caliphate, both of those available through Amazon at Amazon.com. And I'll put links to uh, where you can get those in the show notes. His website is OccidentalJihadist.com. And uh, we are honored to uh, benefit from his uh, expertise and to call him a friend. And so again, from 2015... We bring back Dr. Timothy Furnish. Glad to be here, Derek. The uh, Islamic State, uh, as I summarized, and again, perhaps overly simplistically, uh, is comprised of a group 
that uh, grew out of the disaffected remnant of the uh, the officer corps of the Iraqi military, or at least so we're told. Um, Sunnis, career military men who suddenly had no um, career options, found themselves in jail together and got radicalized. Uh, so we, we can possibly point a finger at the Bush administration's decision to go that route. Uh, the Obama administration, which knew from the Defense Intelligence Agency in 2012 uh, that arming al-Qaeda in Iraq might result in an independent Islamic state that would destabilize Syria and Iraq. Uh, that was uh, according to uh, the documents released by Judicial Watch uh, earlier this year. Um, but but is there more to it than that? What, what What is it about that part of the world that has given rise to the the apocalyptic worldview of the Islamic State? Well, uh, yeah, let, let's try to break this down here, Derek. There are really sort of three facets to the Islamic State in terms of who, who, who whom it's comprised of. One is, as you correctly point out, uh, disaffected and former members of Saddam's military who were ostensibly secular, secular, uh, who were Sunni, but ostensibly secular, because Saddam, remember, was an Arab socialist, uh, much like his, his, uh, his, um, his analogous rulers, I guess you could say, over in Syria, the Assads, both, uh, both uh, Hafez, the father, and now Bashar, the son. Um, they were Arab socialists, members of what's called the Ba'ath Party. Now, uh, so these guys... After, after we uh, took Saddam down, these guys were, uh, as you said, out of work, and they gravitated over to the main Sunni opposition to the United States. But they did not, however, create it. They did not create ISIS, nor did they create the, the predecessor movements, which were the um, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, basically. Uh, the, well, there was the Islamic State of Iraq. Before that, basically, it was an al-Qaeda adjunct in Iraq. And then before that, it was even something called Tawhid wa Jihad. So these guys were your basic Sunni fundamentalist jihadists who wanted an Islamic state and wanted to get rid of Saddam. So it's a bit ironic that the former, some of the former, you know, colonels uh, and, and such in Saddam's military joined forces with these guys, but they eventually, of course, discovered they had more in common than they had um, than they had uh, differences. And there's another major element to this, which to some degree overlaps these two. Um, there is a strong element in the Islamic State of a Sufi group, an Islamic mystical group, uh, from what's called the Naqshbandi order, which is one of the many Sufi orders and mystical orders in Islam uh, that still exist in the modern world, called Jaysh al Rajawa al um, uh which is uh, the army of the men of the Naqshbandi order, basically. And under Saddam, it seems that a lot of the ostensibly secular uh, officer corps actually belong to Sufi organization, which in some ways is sort of like belonging to, you know, the Rotary Club or the Lodge or something in the United States. But in another way, it's not, because the Sufi orders, by and large, in Islam, still have retained a very real religious, as, as I said earlier, religious mystical element. Um, and Generally in Islamic history, uh, these Sufi mystics tend to be at loggerheads with the Salafi jihadists that usually make up your groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. But, as I point out in a number of my books, particularly uh, one of the new ones that's out, the Ten Years' Captivation book, some of the most violent jihads in Islamic history have been led by these Sufis. So they're not simply sort of, you know, Quakers with beards and guys who sit around and meditate on Allah all day. They sometimes take up arms and fight. In this Naqshbandi order, which is very prominent in Iraq going back to even pre-Ottoman times, uh, was one of the ones most renowned for being jihadist. So in a sense, it's not, it's not that much of a stretch to see why these guys would link up with people fighting what they see as as occupiers, and then after that, of course, after we've left, they see they, they are Sunni, most Sufis are Sunnis, and they see a country, they see Iraq being ruled by the Shia majority as, as not a safe place for them, as well as an aberration. So they have these three elements sort of have come together to make up the, 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 you know, the core of the Islamic State. Um, now, as far as what else you mentioned, the eschatological part of this, You've got a lot of Muslims who are convinced that we are in the end times. And by end times, it's not exactly the same as when Christians speak of the end times. You know, when we speak of the end times, 
you know, and I, I'm a Lutheran. I go to church every Sunday and recite either the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed, one mm-hmm. of the elements, of course, of which is that Christ will come again, the judge of the living and the dead. But for most of us, I think it's safe to say that once Christ comes back, you know, we're history has sort of ended, okay? Uh, you know, you're not going to have people fighting wars. I mean, there will be, of course, the Armageddon at the end of time. But you're not going to have nation-state actors, and humans, in a sense, really aren't actors anymore. They're sort of they're sort of very passive, I guess you could say. It's all on God's timetable. In Islam, it's very different. In Islam, the end time... It's almost a misnomer, in fact, I think, Derek, to say the end times. Because in Islam, when the, when the Mahdi, who is the primary... Messianic figure of Islam, the rightly guided one, which is what Mahdi means. When he comes, and when Jesus comes back, because again, in Islamic thought, Jesus is, a, is an Islamic prophet who was not crucified, he was taken to heaven, he will come back, and he will join forces with the Mahdi, basically to fight the forces of evil and take over the world. These two will lead Muslims to take over the world and will establish a worldly state. What, what, what some of the writings call Malakut Allah, the kingdom of Allah. And so Jesus and the Matthew working together basically established this via both violent jihad, conquering the enemies who, of Islam, who, be le, who will be led by the sort of the Antichrist figure in Islam called the Dajjal, the deceiver, uh, and, and, the, and his supporters. So this idea, uh, again, it's being ramped up. And, and groups like ISIS particularly believe in this, and they're working to, and I clearly, uh, I, I think it's clear that they're trying to, what's called hotwire the apocalypse, they're trying to goad us into attacking, because as you mentioned earlier, with the Battle of Dabak, which is a small town in the Syrian border up near, uh, up near the uh, Syrian-Turkish border, there is a hadith in Islamic tradition that says that the, that the Muslims will fight the, what's called the Rum. The, the Romans, which, of course, when this hadith was written, meant the Byzantines, the Byzantine Christians. And, of course, the, uh, ISIS conflates us with crusaders. And who are the crusaders? It's always the Americans, maybe maybe the French to a certain extent, but it's always Western Christians. So they are convinced they will win this battle. And if they can just goad us into attacking, putting ground forces, they think they, they will win it. But, again, this is not an extremist or radical view Belief in the Mahdi is very mainstream, both in not just in Shia Islam, but in Sunni Islam. And the Pew data from 2012, I believe it was, uh, which specifically ask about this question over several, uh, Muslim populations, several dozen countries. And the average was about 42% of Muslims responded affirmatively to the question, do you believe the Mahdi will come in your lifetime? So uh, hmm. 42% of 1.5 billion is over 600 million people. That's, that's so a lot. ISIS is, is ISIS is is exploiting this. I, I think they all they clearly believe it, as do other groups in Islam, in Islamic terrorist networks, and others, as well as some peaceful groups. But they're clearly this is this is an idea that's shared by tens, if not hundreds, of millions of Muslims. So, in other words, um, while Western governments may have seen uh, or, or perceived an advantage in trying to use this. Uh, you know, kind of violent strain within Islam to achieve certain foreign policy ends, removing Assad from power, uh, regardless of what the uh, the reasons were. Uh, the actual root beliefs that that uh, led to the creation of an Islamic state and the actions that has taken since then actually go back a lot farther than uh, well, farther than even the United States of America. Right, they go back to the other days of Islam, but I, but I don't think anyone in our government paid any attention to this. I mean, we were clueless about this sort of thing. Both the Bush administration and the Obama, well, the Bush administration was clueless. The Obama administration, I think, is willfully ignorant about it. Um, that you know, we have an administration now that won't even admit that jihad is the operative concept driving Islamic terrorism, <laughs> which is something they shout at us every day. They're they're not going to even begin to mention anything about uh, you know apocalyptic beliefs within this. So I don't think we knew anything about this. Um, we did not realize if we had had some, if you know, and, and this this is on the Bush administration. If they had, and again, by saying this, I'm not saying the Bush administration created ISIS. That's absurd. It's absurd. Islam created ISIS. The Bush administration, by destroying some of the barriers to jihadist um, takeovers uh, in places like in places like Iraq. In places like well, Afghanistan is sort of a different case, but but basically, particularly in Iraq, you had a government that was that was that was a secular government, as we said, socialist, that kept the jihadists and the Salafis, the Islamic fundamentalist Sunnis, at bay. And when you remove that, even if you're ostensibly doing it in the name of democracy, and again, 65% of the population of Iraq is Shia, 
Well, basically what you've done is put in, put in power is the brand of Islam that arguably has the strongest belief in this sort of messianic thing. So, um, but, you know, American and Westerners in general, Americans particularly, is woefully unprepared to deal with this because, you know, we won't do our homework and we go barging in and we think that, you know, we think that, as we did when when, when the uh, so-called Arab Spring started, right? Uh, everybody was. This is the greatest thing, you know. All the intelligentsia in the administration, and the, and I use the term intelligentsia very loosely. <laughs> uh, but 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 the, the experts. Oh, it, this is wonderful, you know. The New York Times editorial board and everyone else. Well, under the sort of ridiculous premise that the Arab world, the Muslim world in general, and the Arab world in particular is chock full of budding Jeffersonian Democrats who, because they're on Twitter, clearly must be Western style moderates. <laughs> and and once we get rid of, you know, the Mubareks and the Assads and the Qaddafis of the world, then, you know, uh, a million flowers will bloom. And no, what happened was by getting rid of people like Mubarak and Qaddafi and bastard that Qaddafi was, he kept the jihadists at bay in Libya. Basically, you made Libya. Libya is a failed state. It's it's much like Syria. Syria gets all the attention. Libya is basically breaking up into two or three pieces, at least one of which will probably be ruled by jihadists. Mm-hmm. So that's what getting rid of Qaddafi did. And because we have this, you know, Bush had this and Obama has it even in spades and goes different directions with it too, this this naive Wilsonian view that the whole world wants uh, what we want. No, there are a lot of people in the Muslim world that want Sharia law and that want Islamic law. Um, you know, I, I, a few years ago in Israel, I was fortunate enough to have dinner with uh, some people, one of whom was the former Egyptian, excuse me, the former Israeli ambassador to Egypt. And he was, and we were talking about this because this was in 2013 and the Arab Spring, quote unquote, was, was, was ongoing, of course. And he told me at one point he was in a meeting with Hosni Mubarak and Mubarak had said, he, Mubarak was just livid. Uh, he said, don't, he said, don't the Americans understand <laughs> my people are not ready for democracy. Who's name Mubarak said that? Mm-hmm. He said maybe they will be in a few decades or a century, but they aren't now. <laughs> so, still, still very tribal. But, but yeah. you know, we do this. I mean, I can't tell you how many people in the State Department and the intelligence community and even in the military I've run across, although less so, thank God, the military. But people will think that it's it, they they can't get out of the way they think and and, and put in put themselves in somebody else's shoes and think like that, which is what you have to do if you have, want to be a decent analyst. Some people can do this, but then that's probably the people at CENTCOM, CENTCOM who got their, you know, reports spiked. <laughs> exactly, so yes. we, we project onto, I mean, look, we're all guilty of this because we're human, but but when, when you do what I've done for as long as I've done it, this is kind of sad, actually, Derek, but I can actually kind of think like jihadists, and I can think like these messianic guys, because I study this stuff all the time. And if you just slip over a little bit and put on the guise of looking at the world from their point of view, even for just a few minutes, you go, wait a minute, this stuff makes sense from their point of view. Well, yeah, it... uh... We, we, we in the West have trouble understanding why, uh, for example, Boko Haram went and, and captured all those young girls who had been uh, you know, sent off to school through initiatives uh, sponsored by Western governments. Uh, if you're thinking like them, you're seeing that as a, uh, a, a war of cultures, and the Westerners trying to destroy your culture from within. So in that and your sense, religion. And, your religion. and your religion. Yep. And so mm-hmm. in that sense, the response makes sense. Uh, because they're basically trying to eliminate the uh, uh, what, what they're seeing as as an almost military initiative to try and destroy your culture. Now, I, you know, obviously, I don't agree with the, the fact that you're using uh, you know, making girls a, a, a schoolgirls a military target. But uh, again, if you're thinking with their view of the world, their actions actually make sense. And what we keep trying to do, you see this all the time, particularly on the left. Some on the right do it too, but it's particularly bad on the left, is we try to project what we think is the rationale onto them. Okay, and, and, and what's the primary one, Derek? Well, it must be because they're poor and don't have jobs. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, and not just idiots like Marie Hark at the State Department say this. This is a common trope. I read The Economist every week, okay? And, uh, and I read it oftentimes grimacing and, you know, punching the wall or something. But I mean, if you want to know what's going on in the world, The Economist is one of the best places, but their analysis is just ridiculous. They, the, the writers of The Economist basically think that Islamic terrorism is caused by poverty. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no data to back this up. It's ludicrous. But but see, but that's easier. That's projecting onto them what we think it should be. Instead of why don't we just take the people in ISIS and Boko Haram and Lashkar e Taiba and the Taliban and Al Qaeda and I won't go and list the other 47 groups on the State Department International Terrorist Group list. <laughs> but why don't we just take them at face value and say maybe they're doing it for jihad, which is what they scream at us every day. Mm-hmm. And, but but then you have to say it has an Islamic basis, and it's not in contra. This is where I have problems with people on the Republican side, too. We keep using this language, Islamic radicalism, radical Islam, Islamic extremism. Folks, jihad is neither radical nor extreme in Islam. It's quite mainstream. The founder of Islam himself waged jihad. Allah enjoins jihad in the Quran multiple times. Things like beheadings... Are, were, done, were ordered by Muhammad. So until we come to terms with that and admit that at the core of the world's second largest religion, there's a very violent strain that needs to be addressed, we're going to continue to flounder and not be able to deal with yeah. this issue. And the thing that disturbs me a little bit is that in the uh, sort of alternative uh, media community that, that I inhabit, you know, people are, are loath to believe anything that they hear from the mainstream media. So whenever you begin talking about the Islamic State or the Taliban or Al Qaeda or uh, any of the other groups that, and their radical beliefs as being part and parcel of, of their faith, immediately the uh, the accusations start to fly. Well, you're just regurgitating what you hear on the mainstream media. No, not exactly. Uh, and, and that was kind of the point I was hoping we could get to today with this conversation. Um, mm-hmm. That that uh, let, let, let's go back. You know, what what are the roots of these beliefs that are manifesting in the uh, the actions of the Islamic State today. You, you mentioned the hadiths. Uh, w- w- for for people who aren't really familiar, the difference between the Quran itself and the hadiths. Uh, how do they differ, and how do uh, say the different sects, Sunni and Shia, uh, interpret these differently? Uh, and and you know then then how does again does how does that manifest in in the way we see the Islamic State acting today? Right. Okay. Well, for. There are two corpuses, corpi, two, two bodies of written uh, authority for Muslims. The Quran, of course, is number one. It is believed by the vast majority of Muslims to be literally the word of God, of Allah, and that it applies across space and time. That that is that when it was compiled in the seventh or eighth century, or perhaps later, we don't know for sure, uh, but they believe that, of course, it was uh, you know revealed to Muhammad in the seventh century that. It is as valid to Muslims today as it was then, all right? And it should be applied literally. Okay, and this is a major difference between the understanding of the Bible among Christians, the world's largest religion, and the understanding of the Quran. Yes, there are many, many Christians uh, that take the Bible literally and say it should all apply literally. But frankly, if you look at the world's 2.2 billion Muslims, Christians that believe that are a minority. The majority of Christians in the world, particularly the Catholics, uh, the Orthodox and some other uh, denominations believe that, yes, there is much in the Bible that is literal, but there is much that should be understood figurative or symbolically mm-hmm. or allegorically or things like that. This viewpoint of non-literalism is the minority viewpoint in Islam. And in fact, it's only held among some sects of Islam. It is, it is generally considered by mainstream Sunnism and by mainstream Twelve or Shiism, to a certain extent, to be rank apostasy. And this is why it is so hard for Muslims, for instance, to say condemn things like beheadings. I wrote an article on beheading back in 2005. If your listeners want to Google it, it's called um, Beheading in the Name of Islam. It's really, unfortunately, I'm known for this. One of the few articles, scholarly articles ever written on beheading in Islam. And I looked at the Quran and these hadiths, which I'll get to in a second. But I looked at Islam across Islamic thought by commentators, the two different passages of the Quran, uh, Surah Al-Muhammad verses 3 and 4 and Surah Al-Anfal verse 12, which say behead the unbelievers when you encounter them on the battlefield and elsewhere. Okay? And, you know, if, if, if problematic issues in the, in, in, in the Bible, for instance, Christians will say, well, it doesn't apply to us. And the example I always use is uh, the snake handling one. In right. Matthew and in Luke, I believe it is, Jesus tells the disciples, you'll be able to do things like pick up poison snakes and drink poison and things like that. Now, you know, 99.9% of us think that only applied to the apostles that were standing there when Jesus said it. Right. Of course, then you have these guys in these churches, and I knew some of them growing up in Kentucky, the so-called snake handler churches, where they take the <laughs> copperheads and the water moccasins out on at Sunday night services and 
and there's a reason, Derek, why there aren't very many snake handler Christians. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, but but you know, but that but they take it literally. Say so applied in Jesus' time applies now. And again, most Christians don't think like that. Okay, but in Islam, you're not allowed to to, to say. Well, the beheading passage is only applied when Muhammad said it, you know, to Ali, when he told Ali to behead people making fun of him, which he actually did. <laughs> um, it has to apply now. So ISIS, therefore, has the exegetical upper hand or any other group that wants to behead. They'll say, well, we're just doing what the Quran literally says. And people can pretend all day long that it's not Islamic, but there it is. And if, you know, if you don't like the fact that maybe somebody says this on Fox, which actually nobody will, my experience being on Fox is they're as politically correct as the rest of them for right. the most part. Yep. But 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 which I, which is why I think it's kind of funny about you talking about turning to the media people. But go get the Quran yourself and read it. Although there are not very many good translations, read it yourself. Or go look at my website. I break this stuff down. So that's the Quran. That's the number one source. And just sort of barely below that, because the Quran's one at one A, are the hadiths. Okay, hadith means basically saying or utterance. Uh, and there are many 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 thousands of hadiths that are alleged to be the sayings of Muhammad. So, so they are, they are of only slightly less authority than the Quran. Basically, the Quran is believed to be not the word of Muhammad, but the word of Allah himself. The Hadiths are believed to be the words of Muhammad. And um, the Sunnis have at least four major collections, multi-volume collections of Hadiths. The Shia have a whole bunch more, because the Hadiths for the Shia are not simply what Muhammad said, but particularly the Twelve are Shia, which is the majority in Iran and Iraq, the largest group of the of the Shia, uh, believe that there that there were twelve Imams after Muhammad who should have been the legitimate leaders of the community, and that these guys' utterances also count as hadiths. So they've got many, many, many more hadiths mm, to deal with. Okay. But, but if we just stick with Sunnis, okay, so Sunnis again, who are eighty five percent of the world's Muslims. You've got, beside the Quran, you've got these hadiths. Now, a lot of the hadiths deal with stuff that's in the Quran, and there's sort of commentary on it. Like, there's quite a bit in the Quran about Jesus. And again, it's, it's quite different from the by, Jesus of the Bible, but he's in there. And a lot of hadiths deal with Jesus. But there's a, there are a lot of hadiths that deal with things that aren't in the Quran at all. And the primary example, the main one I've studied, is the Mahdi. Again, the primary messianic figure of Islam. The Mahdi is nowhere mentioned in the Quran. There are pretty extensive hadiths about it, but the many Muslims, probably the slight majority of Muslims that don't believe in the Mahdi, would say, well, we don't believe in it because it's not in the Quran, it's only in the hadiths. So, so you have that argument between Muslims, but, so there's that. There are other sources of Islamic uh, authority, too. I mean, those are the two primary written sources, but basically there are several different uh, aspects to Islamic authority that, that, that contribute to the development of Sharia law or Islamic law, uh, commentary by famous scholars over the years. Uh, they look at this, there's something called ijma, which is consensus of the scholars. What have the scholars said about an issue over the years, like beheading or, or how many wives you can have or, or how do you treat infidels or, you know, whatever, sometimes very picky and things, right? Like how to wash your hands before prayer, things like that. I mean, there's just tons of these things. These people will issue fatwas, you know, Islamic religious rulings over the years. And then, Eventually, they had, and again, over 1,436 years it is now of Islamic history, you've got thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of, of scholarly opinions, and they break down into several major schools of what's called fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, Hanbali, Hanafi, Maliki, and Shafi'i, that's on the mm. Sunni side, and then the, Sh uh, the Shia have their own different schools of what's called Islamic jurisprudence. So you've got all of this mixed in there, okay? And the thing is, what it amounts to, really, Derek, is, is, is there is no one authority in Islam. Hmm. You can't even say that the Quran alone is an authority because, because there are Muslims that will say, well, we read the Quran and, and, and we don't really like the Hadith. They're a minority, but you do have folks like that. And you can also pick and choose, which is what, Dabik, which is what ISIS does very well in Dabik. A lot of the terrorist groups will do this. They will take something that's legitimately Muslim, like beheading or like, you know, polygamy. Uh, Surge on the saw clearly says you're allowed four wives. And it also says, by the way, that if they misbehave, you're allowed to beat them. It clearly <laughs> mm -hmm. says that. Again, I've read this in Arabic. <laughs> it wasn't made up by Dick Cheney's staff or anything. Okay? It says that. <laughs> um, 
But what they will do is they will pick and choose from the glosses, from the commentaries, from the scholarly consensus to say, well, we only pick scholars that we that, that, that say things we like to hear, like you're allowed to behead unbelievers whenever you want. And so they'll pick people like uh, famously Ibn Taymiyyah, who lived in the 14th century, or Ibn um, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, the founder of the Wahhabi sect in Saudi Arabia, who are really sort of the hardest core of the hardest core, right? So that's what they will do. You know, the, the, any any dissenting voices, any contrarian voices, they will just ignore because they'll say, well, they're, they're not true Muslims. So, hmm. so but what this really boils down to, Derek, in a lot of ways is that is that it's a fight within Islam for what's legitimate. Is it is it accurate to say ISIS is not Islamic? No, they're very Islamic. Are they the totality of Islam? No, this is where I take issue with, you know, some of my conservative brethren. It is, it is no more, if it is incorrect to say that Islam is a original religion of peace, which it clearly is incorrect to say, because jihad is intrinsic to Islam, it is also equally wrong to say Islam is only a religion of the sword and of war, because that's clearly not the case either. Because, again, it's the world's second largest religion. There are not just... Sunni and Shia, but there are dozens, if not hundreds, of sects in Islam, and many of them believe, you know, different things from the other ones. Okay, there are some common denominators. Again, as I said, it is true that that a literal reading of the Quran is the uh, primary mainstream understanding in Sunni Islam. And again, this is why groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda and Boko Haram and a lot of these other really hardcore groups that we call terrorist groups, because they are. This is why it's so hard to refute them from an Islamic point of view. I'm reading a little book right now I just got um, from, oh, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's downstairs, I'll have to downstairs. Um, it's by, oh no, I found it right here. It is by Sheikh Muhammad al-Yakubi, who is a prominent Syrian sheikh and a Sufi of a different order than the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's called, uh, English translation is Refuting ISIS, a Rebuttal of Its Religious and Ideological Foundations. It's published in English, and I got it, and it's about 60, 65 pages. And, you know, I really want to like this book. And, you know, all due respect to the, to the good sheikh, who I'm sure understands Islam better than me, but the argument basically in his book boils down to ISIS is not Islamic because I don't like them. <laughs> Okay. All because right. they're making Muslims look bad. Ah. He's not really refuting ISIS on the basis. He does point out, as I said, that they do pick certain scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah, and they don't adduce, you know, contrary scholars, you know. But 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 what it boils down to basically, and, and this guy is a heavy hitter, okay, in the Islamic world, all right? And this is just not getting it done. The, 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 his argument Again, basically boils down to he's not refuting ISIS, and I've read all their Dabic magazines, which is the name of their magazine, too, named after that town where the mm -hmm. Armageddon battle is supposed to take place. They adduce the Quran. They adduce many, many, many hadiths. They adduce um, uh, scholars, again, a sort of narrow range of scholars, but they are legitimate scholars within Islam. And so you can't just refute them by saying you're not Muslim and sort of sticking your fingers in your ears and wagging them. That's really not going to do it. You're going to have to deconstruct. But here's the problem, Derek. Again, it goes back to what I was saying. The problem with deconstructing the ideological foundations of groups like ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda and so on and so forth is that they are Quranic literalists. To, mm -hmm. So if you attack them, you would have to say, you know that stuff about beheading that you're doing? That doesn't apply to us. That applied in the Prophet Muhammad's time. It doesn't apply to us. But see, that's not acceptable in Islam, Derek. Mm -hmm. You can't right. say that. If you say that, you yourself are an apostate. Hmm. So that's the problem. And this is why I tell people, look, I'm sorry, but it, people talk about an Islamic reformation. I don't even know that that's the right word. Islam has to get to the point where they can tolerate their own sects, S-E-C-T-S, mm -hmm. without coming down on them for saying... There are some sects of Islam that say things like this. There's a group called the Ahmadis, uh, who developed in India in the late 19th century. They had a guy who, who uh, called Ghulam Ahmed Shah, who claimed to be the Mati and the return Jesus rolled into one. Hmm. Okay? And his group, there are about 15, maybe 20 million of them, um, and they are truly moderate. They have abandoned jihad, but they are considered to be, you know, basically wackos by mainstream Muslims because they believe this guy was the Mahdi and Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
which contravenes normal Sunni thought, which says that neither one of them showed up yet. But, you know, there are sects like that. If you add them up, there are probably maybe 80, 90 million out of one and a half billion uh, members of these sects that believe this. So it's going to be decades, if not, I hate to say this, but if not centuries before mainstream Islam gets to this point where it's willing to say the Quran doesn't have to be read literally. Because now if you say that, you are in danger of your own life in many countries around the world. Hmm. I mean, people, may, people may say, you know, look, I, I was raised Southern Baptist, and I always tell my people I'm a often tell people I'm a recovering Southern Baptist, but you know, even the hardest core of hardest core Southern Baptists, I'm pretty sure don't no longer kill you for saying that you don't believe in the literal uh, rendering of the Bible. You know, I mean, Hollywood and, and, and the intelligentsia likes to pretend that Christians are that bad, but right, they really right. aren't. No. Um, I mean, even Bill Maher has admitted that finally, but, <laughs> but, you know, but it took a while to get to that point, and, and it's going to take Islam a while to get to the point. In the main, in, 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 you know, in the meantime, the people that believe that sort of thing are killing people in Paris. Mm-hmm. With fourteen hundred years of Islamic history behind us, and um, this idea that they, they've not yet moved to a point where they can tolerate somebody saying, "Well, we can't accept this because this doesn't apply anymore." Um, mm-hmm. Have we seen, you know, what other movements are there historically that have tried to do what the the Islamic State is trying to do now? Oh, what the Islamic State is doing? Well, let's see. Do you mean in term in terms of jihad? There have been many, 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 many. If you term if you mean in terms of jihad plus, plus the apocalyptic element, yes, yes. Well, there have been a surprisingly large number. Again, I dealt with those. I dealt with some of those, I should say, in my book from two thousand and five, Holiest Wars. Um, which I wrote that book because when I was in grad school at Ohio State and started studying Islamic apocalyptic and, and such, and jihads that were centered around this such a belief, particularly someone claiming to be the Mahdi, uh, the, the, the sort of conventional wisdom, particularly in, even in the scholar community, scholarly community, was that it was mainly you know a twelve or Shia phenomenon. And and I uh, actually had taken a class on uh, jihads in African history with a nice Sudanese scholar, a wonderful man, Ahmed Sakanga. Uh, and we, I was surprised to find out that, of course, that this uh, major, one of the major uh, Mahdi movements in history, the Sudanese Mahdi, a guy named Muhammad Ahmed of the 1880s, about whom the movie Khartoum was made mm-hmm. with Charles Heston and Lawrence Olivier, one of Olivier's worst roles, by the way, I hate to say that, but um, that this group was Sunni. And then I started doing some research into it and found that there have been a whole lot of guys leading movements in Islamic history that were claiming to be, you know, sort of apocalyptic eschatological movements and the guy leading it claiming to be the Mahdi, that they were Sunni. So anyway, so I dealt with eight of these in that book. Um, I bring up a bunch more in my new book, 10 Years Captivation with Mahdi's Camps, which, by the way, it's sort of an unwieldy title, but I did it because it's sort of an inside joke. There is a very famous book that came out in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, uh, by a British uh, major who interviewed a Viennese, a, an, an Austrian priest who had been captured by this Mahdi, the Sudanese Mahdi that I was just talking about, by hmm. his people, and held as a slave for 10 years. Wow. Poor priest. The man finally got loose, and the British wound up with the British in Egypt, and the British debriefed him, and the guy debriefing him was this British major who actually wrote a book about it. So uh, it was called 10 Years Captivity in the Mahdi's Camp. So hmm. that's, that was the take of my book. But, but basically, I talk about this quite a bit. Um, and it's again, it's not something just of, of ancient history either. In, uh, in 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 Turkey in the 1930s, there was a movement uh, after the Ottoman Empire had fallen apart and the Turkish Republic was established. There was a movement by some guy claiming to be the Mahdi in Turkey. Um, uh, it was it was crushed by Turkish military forces, but it was there in Western Turkey. Um, in recent years, the most prominent example would be 1979. You're probably familiar with this, Derek. A lot of people aren't. A lot of people are familiar with the movement, but they don't know, they don't realize it was eschatological. In 1979, a group occupied the Great Mosque in Mecca. Right? It was a group led by a guy called Juhayman al Utebi, and they, for about three weeks, took over the Great Mosque in Mecca, and they, they, they put people up in the minarets and were broadcasting that, uh, that the Mahdi had come, and she, cause, because this guy, Juhayman al Utebi, had decided. And whether he believed it or not, I don't know, but he certainly act like it, that his brother-in-law, a guy named Muhammad al-Qahtani, was the Mahdi. 
So, hmm. so these guys had taken over, and the Saudis took it so seriously. The Saudis, first of all, cannot militarily evict them. They wound up getting the French to do it. Huh. Um, but, but they had to... Um, they actually had to have Sheikh bin Baz, who at that time was the chief mufti in Saudi Arabia, publish fatwas in the newspapers, in Arabic, of course, saying, people, calm down, this is not really the Mahdi. Um, so that was one of the most recent prominent examples. I mean, it failed, but for about three weeks, the Saudis were, you know, were, were, were not in good shape with that. Um, so w- what's happened again as... I mean, there's sort of a confluence of events, I guess you could say, that have led to sort of the ramped-up eschatology of groups like ISIS. And part of it, of course, is that the United States occupied a country in the central Islamic world, which was Iraq. Okay, it's very important. If you look at sort of the, and I break this down again in a couple places in my book, the the eschatological tableau, if you will, for Islam is mainly Syria and to a certain extent Iraq, but mainly Syria. You would think it would be Arabia, right, with Mecca and Medina, and there mm-hmm. are hadiths to say that Mahdi will come from Mecca. Um, but most of what the Mahdi does in the hadiths in terms of fighting infidels and so on and so forth, fighting the Dajjal, which he and Jesus will do together, uh, and Jesus will kill the Dajjal, that all takes place for the most part in Syria. So uh, Syria has great eschatological resonance in Islam. Uh, so, so part of that, part of what ISIS is doing is, is because of that. Um, and again, the, uh, there are many, I think, who would tend to say that what ISIS is doing is purely exploitative, that they don't really believe this, that as, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the huge percentage of Muslims that do believe it, that ISIS is sort of piggybacking on that. But, but I don't think that's true. Again, I, I think that you know, and Will McCants also has a really good book out on this topic. Uh, Will's at Will's at um, Brookings, uh, and I forgot the name of his book, but 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 he just came out with a book about a month or so ago on specific, specifically on ISIS eschatology. Hmm. Um, and and Will talks about this so that, that that the leadership of of um, of uh, ISIS and its predecessor movements very enamored of this. So, um, but but they aren't the only ones that hold this. I mean, there are other groups around the world, uh, some terrorists and some not, that, that that believe in the coming of the Mahdi. I mean, there are several prominent Tur- Turkish groups. Uh, you probably heard of Fethullah Gulen. Yes. I bet you have. Gulen lives in Pennsylvania. He was evicted from Turkey in the early 1990s, back when Turkey was <laughs> much more secular. Right. Gulen is, Gulen is a Sufi. He's a Turkish Sufi or Sufi Turk, if you will. Um, who believes in the Mahdi. Um, he heads, he's very important because uh, he's very prominent. In fact, a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, that some magazine that ranked the world's 100 public intellectuals, and he was number one. Mm. He, his organization, the Gulen organization, G-U-L-E-N, with a little umlaut on the U, runs, um, I think next to the Catholic Church, I believe it's the world's largest religious school network. Yeah, and it's the largest um, uh, group of um, of charter schools in the United States. Right. Right. In the United States, they operate ostensibly as STEM schools, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. Right. But there's been a lot of people that say that they also, sub rosa, you know, inject a lot of Islamic beliefs in. But outside of the United States, they're very Islamic. And, and, and I don't think that's all necessarily bad, because the brand of Islam that the Gulen people promote is quite peaceful. Compared, and it's very anti-jihadi in many ways. So, you know, if I had to have a choice between the Taliban or ISIS or Al Qaeda and Gulen, I'll take Gulen, as I've written, every day and twice on Friday. Um, <laughs> so, but 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 the Gulenistas, um, as they're called, um, um, believe in the Mahdi, but they believe in a peaceful Mahdi. In fact, Gulen says in his writings that the Mahdi will 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 win people over with education, not a sword. So, I mean, it's not the Mahdi that ISIS believes in. Hmm. Uh, and there are other movements. I, and again, you know, it's 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 the primary messianic belief system in Islam. So it's not simply it, there's there's a, there's a spectrum of beliefs ranging from you know peaceful to violent and everything in between. And sometimes there's a mixture. I mean, you know, I went to Iran, as you know, I went to Iran in 2008 to a conference uh, specifically on this topic. And 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 you know, the <laughs> papers on all kinds of different things, and these Iranian believers, true believers, talking about it and. You know, some of them give you pause. Like I remember, there was one paper saying, speculating on whether the Mahdi would 
uh, allow Jews and Christians to convert or simply kill all of us until <laughs> I decided I would not bring up any questions at that at that particular panel. But you know there there are other uh, there 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 are many Muslims, particularly Shia, I should say, interestingly enough, twelve or Shia in Iran that believe that the Mahdi will. Yes, he will be a military leader, but he won't force people to believe in Islam, that people will come to believe in it. And it will be more of what's called dawah, which is sort of, you know, Islamic almost evangelism as opposed to jihad. But, you know, there's also many, many groups and people that believe that the Matthew basically is a global warlord and he will conquer the world in the name of Islam. And it'd be, you know, his way or the highway. Mm-hmm. And, and ISIS, I, again, and ISIS, as you, with your question, ISIS is only the latest manifestation of this. This is not a radical understanding. There have been dozens, if not hundreds, of groups in Islamic history that believe that their leader was the Mahdi, and it was, it was eschatological time was coming. I mean, the Ottoman Empire in its time, the Ottomans fought against these guys. There, there, were, there, were, there were dozens of... of, of um, Mathis movements within the Ottoman Empire by self-styled messianic leaders that you know the Ottomans pretty much always crushed because they had a lot of military power, but they had a, they had a sort of a continuing problem with this. In a sense, it it's, it reminds me of um, reading between the lines of the New Testament, where you see the Sanhedrin always looking at these uh, you know this new sect of um, Christ followers, you know these these guys following this this uh, Yeshua bin Yusuf. Um, and uh, is he just another one of these uh, radicals who wants to rebel against Rome, like this other guy or this other guy or this other guy? Almost like you know, the, from the Monty Python film Life of Brian, where you've got all these radical <laughs> movements, like one following after another, to just you know, n- do really not right. accomplishing anything, but just you know, uh, you know, committing suicide in, in front of the you know, in front of the cross, it's just silliness. The, the, but it, there but was it, a Bar Kokhba revolt and many many others. Yes, in the first century BC up through seventy AD. Uh, and remember, the Romans occupied, uh, you know, occupied the Holy Land in about 63 BC. Right. Um, the Romans, the, the Romans had a, they, the mess, Jewish messianic pretenders leading revolts mm-hmm. were a continual thorn in the Roman side. Right. And you ha- and, and that really, if you don't understand that context, you don't understand why Pilate reacted like he did with Jesus. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, because this was Jesus is only the latest in a long line of guys that somebody thought was the Messiah. Now, Jesus, unlike the other guys, didn't tell his followers to pick up swords and kill Romans. Right. But Pilate didn't know that wasn't going to happen. You know, and Pilate was already in hot water with the emperor, so that's a whole other issue. But, <laughs> right, but, yeah. but basically, yeah, I mean, going back for, I mean, decades before Jesus, and even after him, you had messianic revolts, by zealots and by other groups in in in, in Roman what was Roman Judea um, that that they had to deal with. So so Jesus was seen by the Romans as just another one of these guys. Yeah. Mm. So uh, and it's very similar. And again, but I'm sorry, it's very similar to what's going on with Islam. But the difference, of course, is that for Islam, because Islam is so much a larger religion than Judaism. Again, second only to Christianity. Um, it's it, it's 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 believed to be operative on a global scale. Yeah. So that's that's a big difference here. So I mean, ISIS is convinced that the Matthew's going to come. They're going to defeat us. It'll be us because they think we're the Crusaders. We're the modern room, the modern Christian Romans, and that the Matthew will come, and the Matthew and Jesus will then lead them to conquer the entire world. They really believe this. Mm. And again, ISIS is not the only group that believes this. There are other groups that believe it. And they get resonance for this. And this is something I think people haven't looked at. You know, you, you keep seeing these analyses, and why do these Western jihadis, why do these Western, why do these kids from France and Belgium and even the United States or wherever go join ISIS? And they're always looking at, you know, social enemy, and they're always looking at, you know, things like that. You know, and, you know I always tell people, well, you know, 19-year-olds are not really thinking, particularly with the brain at the top of their head that much. So. Yeah. You know, um, there's there, there's that element of a young man must go do something that he fit violent and he thinks is very worthwhile and all that stuff. But I think something that no one looks at is, and, and, and I wish someone would analyze this, to what extent do these eschatological beliefs factor in and attract these guys? Because you're basically telling people, look, we are on the cusp of Islam taking over the world because the Mahdi is about to come, and we're we're basically setting the stage for the Mahdi with what they're doing in Syria. So come on over and help us do it. 
I think that really is a big draw, too, that a lot of analysts don't even think about. Yeah, and at the risk of uh, offending Christians who are listening, there is an element of that in some of the uh, charismatic movement uh, among charismatic Christians here in the United States, uh, especially those that are really reaching out to youth and telling them that they're the generation that's literally going to defeat the Antichrist and death and will be imbued with superpowers, essentially, uh, for the purposes. You know, ben Carson made a remark, sort of not quite that strong, but you know, a couple of weeks ago, I actually I blogged on this. Ben Carson was asked in an interview, and you know, he's a Seventh Day Adventist, mm-hmm. and they have very strong beliefs about eschatology, and he basically said that he thinks we're living in the end times. Um, and yeah, it's you know, that's something else I've written about, Derek, too. Is people I want to take a look at. I've got an entire chapter sort of bouncing, it's, it's comparing Christian and Muslim eschatology. And primarily, I'm talking about evangelical Christians, because most of the rest of us aren't as you know, up, uh, worried about eschatology as evangelicals are, and they mm-hmm. really are. Um, and what I have found in the last decade, 15 years, studying this topic, is that, um, particularly since 9-11, the evangelical Christian world and the Muslim world, in many ways, have sort of become mirror opposites of each other, and they they're like staring at each other. I mean, they're they're evangelical uh, pastors and scholars who are writing things about, of course, the the Antichrist of Revelation being the Matthew, right? You know, and um, and believing that, and, and trying and, and trying to shoehorn what's going on with ISIS and everything else into, you know, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, um, which, by the way, I don't do because I don't think... I, I, I go along with what Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 24, which is what you're not going to figure out, so yeah. don't waste your time. Yeah. Um, I, I do, uh, you know, full disclosure, you know, try to, try to study eschatology as much as I can, but I think it's deliberately obscure for the reason that the enemy... Uh, the principalities, powers, uh, rulers of this present darkness are far more intelligent than we are. And if it was really clear to us, it would be really, really easy for those uh, supernatural entities that uh, seek to do us harm to uh, fabricate a really convincing lie. Um, so we'll, we'll figure it out when, uh, it's like my, my friend says, uh, you know, he's, he's pan-tribulationist. It's all going to pan out in the end. Um, uh <laughs> Well, I'll just leave it at, you know, I, I'm a Christian, like I said, I'm Lutheran, I believe Jesus is coming back. I don't think that I can figure out what it's going to be. Um, but but my problem is, as an analytical lens, is people that will take, people that are, you know, experts in Christian eschatology, and then try to take elements of Islamic eschatology and make it fit. Right, right. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier, because when you're doing that, you aren't trying to understand Muslims on their own terms. Right. You're shoehorning your agenda onto them. And I think, from, I mean, and I think, mm-hmm. in a, from another uh, perspective, I think that's a, that's a little too obvious for the enemy. I mean, if we're going to credit Satan with being the father of lies, he's probably going to come up with something that's a little harder for us to discern than just saying, "Well, this this guy who's leading this group of people who've been saying openly that they want to behead you and kill you and take your daughters uh, is is the Antichrist." Now, I think he's going to be just a little more subtle than that. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm not sure he will be as suave as, you know, um, what's his name in The Omen? Um, oh. Uh, who's the, actor, <laughs> yeah. the British actor that I like, the guy that played Jurassic Park. Uh, um, Sam Neill, right. <laughs> yeah, Sam Neill, right. Sam uh, Neill. Uh, probably won't be that suave, but yeah, yeah, I think you're right. He probably won't be quite as crass as, as uh, ISIS, who are, you know, about as subtle as a, well, as subtle as a beheading. Exactly, exactly. Well, you get two new books out, uh, Ten Years' Captivation with the Matthews Camps and Sects, Lies, and the Caliphate. How do the two books differ from one another in your approach to un- helping us understand the uh, uh, this radical Mactism? Well, let me say real quick, Sex, Sex Lies, and the Caliphate will actually probably be out next week. Okay. Um, but, but the other one's out. But yeah, thank you for saying that. The difference is this, Ten Years' Captivation with the Matthews Camps is specifically on Islamic eschatology. And, and I focus like a laser beam. Sorry, I focus as much as I can uh, on ISIS and on Iran. Uh, I talk about other elements. I talk about some history, like I said, with this thing about the Ottomans dealing with this sort of thing. Uh, but but I, I try to. I have very long chapters on ISIS on Iran and on Iran. So it's mainly eschatology, apocalyptic, that sort of thing. Sex lies in the caliphate. I try. I, I don't entirely steer clear of eschatology, but I mostly deal with uh, basically. Islamic 
the, the doctrines of Islam that are problematic, and I also deal with Islamic sects. And again, I always have to say this when I'm talking to the military, that's S-E-C-T-S. <laughs> um, I talk about uh, I talk about things like jihad, and I talk about like I was talking with you earlier about beheading, jihad, um, elements of Islam that we are told continually by people like the CIA director and the President of the United States that really aren't Islamic. Uh, and I talk about how well they actually are Islamic, and until we admit that, and the Muslim world deals with them, as you know, the President of Egypt said back in January, um, it's going to continue to be a pro- they're going to going to continue to be problems that bedevil the world. Uh, so I uh, mainly, and I also talk about, as I mentioned earlier, I talk about the different sects of Islam, not just Sunni and Shia, but some of these other folks that I talked about, like Ahmadis and Sufis, and uh, a lot of people don't know that besides the Twelver Shia, there are two other major groups of Shia, the Seveners, or the Ismailis, and the Fivers, or the Zaydis, which are the ones in Yemen, who have slightly different beliefs. I talk about groups like the Alawis in Syria. So but I, I just want to let everybody know that I, I tried to write these books. They, 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 I've rewritten a lot of it, but a lot of it is um, stuff that I've written before, and a lot of it is some articles that I've published in places like History News Network that have either disappeared or gotten buried. And what I've done is arranged them chronologically and topically, and I've tried to write them so that it's not scholarly, okay? I mean, I have a couple, maybe there's a couple of uh, chapters that have footnotes, but for the most part, it's just I'm talking about things. I provide links, particularly in the, in the Kindle version. I got links uh, to radio interviews, TV interviews I did, to other sources if people want to check it. So I really think both books could work as, um, I mean, they're complementary, and one's eschatology and one is sort of non-eschatology Islam. And I think they will help explain a lot of the stuff that's going on because I trace the development really over the last decade, of uh, like things like why are groups beheading? I trace the development of why, um, again, this belief in the Manti seems to increase so much here in the 21st century, things like that. Hmm. I will uh, post a link to uh, Tim's website, mackneywatch.org, as well as uh, to a couple of articles that I've uh, uh, well, at least one that I've referred to before, What's Worse Than Violent Jihadists, which is the uh, article from 2005 uh, in which he lays out uh, the the uh, al- almost a prophetic uh, prediction of the, the rise of the Islamic State. Also, the, uh, the article he mentioned during the uh, interview here um, regarding the uh, beheading in the name of Islam. I'll put links to those in the show notes at vftb.net, uh, as well as links to the two new books. Uh, I've got the one on my Kindle already starting to go through it and highlight it, and uh, I think this is going to be really uh, helpful and educational to better understand what's actually going on in the Middle East. And um, uh, I think the key takeaway, at least for me, um, is that this is a uh, uh, has got much longer historical roots than most of us in the West are aware. Uh, if you had to pick, say, or, or at least uh, identify a, one takeaway or what you hope a reader would get out of these books uh, either both or, or the the two books separately, uh, if they're different goals, purposes for writing them, Tim, uh, what would you hope that uh, a reader coming in would, would uh, get from these books? Well, from the from the 10 Years Captivation book, it would be, I think, as we both mentioned, that that that, that math is and the belief in the math, uh, and the belief that some leaders coming to bring about uh, the events that will cause Islam to take over the world is, you know, we got it with ISIS, but it goes way back. It may not go quite 1,400 years back, but it goes probably at least 1,300 years back in Islamic history. So it's nothing new, and it's really, frankly, not that far out of the mainstream. Um, the other book, I think, um, I, I, the other book in some ways I think maybe is more hopeful because I point out in that book, again, that although there are many lies in Islam, in fact, there's an entire doctrine devoted to allow, allowing you to lie to non-Muslims called, called Taqiyya or Kitman, mm-hmm. that many Muslim groups want the caliphate. But I also point out that there are sects of Islam that are not violent, uh, that read the Quran differently from the ISIS's of the world, or for that matter, from the Al-Azhar, uh, Al-Azhars of the world in Cairo. And that these groups, I think, are increasingly speaking out, and I think that eventually... The sects of Islam that are not literalist will, I think, help lead the other Muslims, although it may take years, as I said, help lead other Muslims to, uh, to, to, dis- to the point where Muslims will disabuse themselves of the violent, of the violent jihadists. Hmm. Dr. Timothy Furnish, the author of the two new books, uh, 
sects, sects lies and the caliphate and uh, 10 years captivation with the Mahdi's camps. I'm going to have to learn to pronounce that correctly. It's Mahdi and not Mahdi. Uh, either one works for me, Derek. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your work. Your website, MacneyWatch.org. And uh, thank you especially for giving up time on this uh, holiday weekend. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Again, remember, this is an archived episode, so the website no longer MacneyWatch.com. It is now OccidentalJihadist.com. OccidentalJihadist.com. You can also follow him on Twitter and recommend that you do so because it is uh, an education. Understanding better what is in the mind of the uh, jihadists who have put America in the crosshairs. Coming up, we're going to find out why an expert on Islamic history who's got a recent book, a scholarly work, 352 pages, heavily footnoted, who was invited to address America's soldier at the United States Army War College, which then rescinded that invitation. This is timely as we go back into the archives to discuss the latest book, Sword and Scimitar, from author Raymond Ibrahim. That's next. As a view from the bunker continues, I'm Derek Gilbert. Millions of people from around the globe were stunned when U.S. President Donald Trump shocked the world by recognizing Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel and ordering the American embassy to be moved there. The United States finally and officially recognized Jerusalem as the true capital of Israel and opened our embassy in the historic and sacred land of Jerusalem. Over 2,000 years have elapsed since Jesus Christ warned of a day when a man of sin, the Antichrist, would appear to lead the world into deception and destruction. Even Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu admits that biblical prophecies are unfolding, that Donald Trump is a King Cyrus-like figure leading the world into a new era of man. President Trump... By recognizing history, you have made history. The Temple Mount is in our hands. Violent protests continued in the Middle East today over President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And now the official Sanhedrin in Israel declare President Trump is advancing a prophetic process that will usher in, when the time comes, the rebuilding of the Third Temple. As the world awaits, a secret incendiary scheme is underway by religious authorities, government agents, and Jewish rabbis to build a third temple. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in that holy place, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be again. The rabbis, Donald Trump, and the top secret plan to build the third temple. Driving the internet to think. This is a view from the bunker. Live every Sunday night. Well, most every Sunday night. We will be back with a live program next week, June 23rd of 2019. I'm Derek Gilbert. Tonight we continue with our pre-recorded program, digging into the archives to get a better understanding of what it is that drives violent Islamists to be violent, mainly against the West. Have we done something wrong? Is it our support for Israel? Or can we learn something from history? You know the old saying, those who uh, fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them, and that seems to be the case with us here in the West. Joining me now from an interview earlier this year in 2019, a gentleman who was invited to speak at the uh, U.S. Army War College. In fact, that uh, speech was supposed to take place, this presentation, this coming Wednesday night, June 19th. And um, last week, he was notified that that uh, invitation had been rescinded. They didn't say it was rescinded. They just said, it's well, it's been postponed, which is kind of a weasel way, to be quite blunt, of canceling the presentation, canceling the invitation without actually canceling it. Why did this happen? Well, 
The subject of his book apparently caught the attention of the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, which uh, is an unindicted co-conspirator, co-conspirator, that is, in one of the largest terror financing cases in American history. Connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. Also, Linda Sarser, the uh, shrill Muslim activist who somehow, even though she advocates for Sharia law, is one of the sponsors of the Women's March. You remember the riot that they sponsored in Washington, D.C. on the day that Donald Trump was inaugurated president. Somehow, the logic of Sharia law being somehow consistent with women's rights escapes me. But we will set that aside. Our our guest has a new book, and and the book which was at the, the heart of this topic, and it won't be the subject of this conversation, we'll actually talk about the book and not about why the book got him disinvited from the U.S. Army War College, um, is a uh, an expert on Islamic history. That is his forte. His uh, scholarly uh, career has, ba- has been based on documenting the, well, the long history of war between Islam and the West. In fact, his new book is titled Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. From earlier this year, we welcome back Raymond Ibrahim. Hi, Derek. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that, and it's uh, great to be with you. This is a topic that... Uh, when you start reading a, a, a military history, and, and your book is a, a, a essentially an analysis of eight key battles between the forces of Islam and the forces of Christendom, for lack of a better term, um, you, you begin to realize that there is a lot more going on today that we as Christians should be paying it to, that we as as a in the West should be paying attention to. Um, but but we yeah. seem to have we seem to have forgotten. Our, our history, it's its like, uh, was it Santayana? You know, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you know, based on what we're always being told, um, you know, by our betters, you know, the, the establishment, whether it's the media or academia or government politicians, namely that Islam is a religion of peace and all the violence being committed in its name is from, you know, criminals and terrorists who have nothing to do with the noble religion of Islam. Um, based on that mantra, which we've been hearing uh, for generations, actually, it's caused people to just not um, – it's, it's created a discontinuity with the history of the West's history with Islam, okay? And in fact, you know, something like ISIS or ISIL or basically the Islamic State, which especially every politician and, you know, talking head has gone out of their way to distance from Islam, if you look at their actions – they are an actual perfect um, mirror duplicate of what Muslim of what 14 centuries of Muslims have been doing in and saying to the West, uh, or mostly Europe in this context. Um, so you know the beheadings and the mass crucifixions and these slave sex slave markets um, and you know burning people alive, all that sort of thing that ISIS has committed. When you look at the history um, as documented, as you mentioned in the book, Sword and Scimitar, 14 centuries, when you look at that history, you're going to find it's it's just it's something that just compete, com- completely kept happening over and over and over every century, many times, except on a exponential level. So in other words, whereas ISIS is just one little small group lo- that was you know located in Syria and Iraq and other areas in that region, um, what was happening historically is that the great caliphates, the great sultanates of history – the Ottomans and the Seljuks and the Abbasids and the Umayyads and so forth, um, under the leadership of the supreme head of the Islamic world, the Caliph or the Sultan, depending on the situation, were issuing literally hundreds of thousands of jihadis into Europe, both from the West, you know, through Spain and from the East and the Balkans and all throughout the Mediterranean, in the same and under the same logic that ISIS used, which is basically you people, Europeans, Christians, are infidels. And it's our duty to subjugate, kill you, enslave you, etc., until you embrace Islam. So you got that for 14 centuries, unwavering. And yet, as you were pointing out, you know, no one gets that today. And instead, we have people seriously saying and being believed by millions that Islam doesn't preach violence, Islam's religion, peace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was reading a popular history uh, of of Islam by a best-selling author recently, and uh, it it became clear to me, and I'm no expert, that she was making apologies for the way Muhammad chose to spread his religion in the early days. Um, And it it struck me that uh, 
we, we've been doing this, it seems, in, in the West for a, a very long time. I mean, when Muhammad's own words, which you cite right at the beginning of the book, uh, Sword and Scimitar, uh, Muhammad's own words, I have been commanded to wage war against mankind until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Wh- why do we not take that seriously? Because if we take that seriously and if we become fully acquainted with the history that we're discussing as in Sword and Scimitar and so forth, it completely undermines um, one of the major bedrocks of Western epistemology, which is basically um, that Islam is peaceful. And the reason Islam is propped up, I don't think, is because secular forces really care about Islam, but rather that's their way of trying to downgrade Christianity. It's this sort of relativism multiculturalism, everything is equal, there's nothing better than the other, and so far, if Christianity has any saving grace to it, well, guess what, so does Islam, so does Buddhism, so does Hinduism. This is a a pillar today in, you know, Western thinking. Um, So I think that's why there's so much ink and resources spent on the propaganda of apologizing uh, for everything that Islam does. And you're right, because there's really no end to the angles that Western um, apologists for Islam will go to to defend it, and and the and the double standards are so obvious. And I'll give you one example of a report I was reading literally right before we started talking about a girl in Germany that was gang raped by seven Muslim migrants. Um, and when you look into the report, you find out that the the German police responded by warning German women that well maybe they shouldn't dress promiscuously, maybe they shouldn't drink alcohol and go out <laughs> alone at night, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of which, of course, is good advice. But of course, and even feminists are later reported in other articles I accessed after I read that, you know, feminists, uh, academics in Norway and in Austria and in all these Western European nations who once would have told, you know, Western Americans and males and so forth that it's a woman's right to dress any way she wants and she can do anything and it's and she shouldn't be afraid. Now they're telling women, don't do that, dye your hair. If you're blonde, dye it dark. If you're living in an area with a heavy Muslim migrant uh, concentration. So my point is, even in this, you know, the, the, the crisis of mass rapes all throughout Europe at the hands of migrants from Muslim nations, is being, you know, we have a new apology for that too. And now it's the Western women's fault for being raped and so forth. So it's definitely a movement that's meant to shield very much and protect Islam. No, oh, brother. Okay. Well, maybe we can get back to that before the end of the uh, mm-hmm. the end of the conversation. But I do want to dive into the history, which uh, I, I've always been kind of a history nerd, but never disciplined enough to really study it seriously. And now I'm uh, old enough to where uh, trying to go back to school to uh, study it might not be practical at this point. Um, you you chose eight bad. Well, let me let me start with uh, Muhammad. Uh, his, his career. Uh, give give us a summary. When did he begin to preach Islam, and at what point did he decide to change tactics? And what was the difference between uh, his original approach to evangelizing and uh, when he finally hit on the formula? You know, the funny thing about Muhammad, in the context of your question, is that. You know, the his biographers and the early Muslim historians who chronicled his life and the early, you know, decades of Islam, you know, were so ingenuous in a sense because they wrote things just as they were without being able to sort of read between the lines and see what it is they're exactly writing and how bad it sounds to a non-Muslim or to basically a person who's thinking rationally. Okay, and so that's just something, you know, (laughs) that's just I'm just trying to preface what I'll tell you by saying that. Okay, so Muhammad is so transparent because in the beginning and, um, you know, and he's born around 570 A.D. And, um, you know, when he's at the age of 40, right around 610 A.D., you know, he finally marries uh, Khadija, you know, who's a rich woman, older than him, et cetera, et cetera. And he finally has the resources now to live a life of leisure, which he decides to do by frequenting caves and um, contemplating. And then one night, uh, um, he gets attacked in this cave by a being, okay, which um, is arguably a genie, because that's exactly what he, a jinn, what he, Muhammad, thought. Mm -hmm. He was actually attacked and squeezed and then told to recite, which, of course, is uh, the word uh, where we get the word Quran from, the Arabic word recite. Um, And, you know, and he ran home frightened. And Khadija, his wife, he told her what happened. And she told him, oh, no, that's an angel of God. Okay, it's not a demon or anything like that. Don't be afraid. He wants you to be a prophet. And to make a long story short, so this 
quote unquote angel, this entity, mm -hmm. kept giving him you know, concepts and words and ideas to recite. He went to the people of Mecca, which was his tribe, um, and they were polytheists at the time, and started telling them all this. Um, they need to change their ways, et cetera, et cetera. But he was just preaching. He wasn't violent. And the reason, of course, is because he was the only one. Um, about after 10 years of preaching, he had maybe 100 followers, most of whom were part of his extended tribe. Okay. And then finally, you know, the Meccans got tired of his agitating and, you know, and cursing their gods and so forth. They drove him out and he left and went to Medina. And then he became a warlord. He had all these people follow him. And then he said, God or Allah has called on us to attack the non-believers, the infidels, the kuffar in Arabic. And um, they started going on these raids. OK. And then they every time they got more, they won and they got plunder from the raids a lot more people came and followed him and it's interesting because when you look at the sources none of this ever comes off as um people uh, found him as spiritually compelling and they believed he was a prophet it's always the more he was victorious the more people followed him and um and you know started raiding under his banner and that was all it was and he kept growing and growing in numbers and strength and he became a warlord with god of course as uh you know the ultimate chief allah and that's you know the long story and finally he dies in 632 according to traditional muslim accounts um, and, you know, the evidence of, you know, how much faith Muslims had in him, right when he died, a humongous chunk of the Arabs broke away and said, OK, you know, we're done with this Islam thing. You know, he had a good run. He's gone. Um, and then and then Abu Bakr, you know, his first uh, the first caliph or successor whose nine year old daughter Muhammad married or, or actually he consummated the marriage when she was nine, but mm -hmm. married her when she was six. He becomes a new leader and he wages a war on all these people and literally tens and thousands of Arabs are crucified, burned alive, tortured just because they wanted to break away from Islam. And this is, of course, will repeat itself throughout history until the present. Um, so that in a nutshell, you know, is Muhammad's rise to power. Um, but now it has this hagiographical veneer by Muslim, later Muslim historians. But like I said, if you look at the original sources, and that's what Christians, when they were when they first encountered Islam in the seventh century and the eighth century, um, this is what they said. They looked at his history, the one that I just delineated, and they said, "So what's so special about this guy? You know, where's his? You know, his claim that he's a prophet is that he was able to attack, kill, plunder, enslave, and rape people. And that's no claim at all, because anyone, you know, any murderer or, or warlord thug can do that. Um, but until today, and this is why, by the way, Muslims." You often hear about uprisings and anger because someone, a non-Muslim, a Christian or whatever, blasphemed against Muhammad. The reason is, it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to criticize Muhammad's life. And all the criticism is right there in Muslim sources, Muslim, Muslim biographies that mm. record all this stuff. That just, and I'll give you another quick example and we can end it. Um, <clears throat> Muhammad, there's a Quran verse, one of the most scandalous stories that really bothered early Christians that Arabs and Muslims were, were taking this man as a prophet, goes like this. Muhammad had a son, uh, an adopted son. Okay, his name is Zaid. Mm -hmm. And he compelled his cousin, Muhammad's cousin, her, whose name is Zainab, to marry him, or his adopted son. They got married. She didn't want to. Okay. And then um, sometime later, he went to visit his adopted son, who he called his son, and he went into his tent, and lo and behold, he saw his wife, Zainab, basically half naked because she didn't have the whole, you know, paraphernalia on the mm -hmm. hijab, niqab, etc. And all of a sudden he got attracted to her. So he left Zay, Zayd, his, uh, his son noticed the attraction and he offered to divorce her. So Muhammad could marry her. Muhammad said, no, no, that's not appropriate. And cause he was thinking what the Arabs would think, you know, his followers. Mm -hmm. So lo and behold, a new verse was revealed by Allah. That's till this day enshrined in the Quran, basically scolding Muhammad for caring about what people will think when God, Allah, wanted Muhammad to marry her all along anyway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so my point is, you know, this stuff is literally recorded there. And early people who were not Muslims, who were not brainwashed, when they saw it, they were scandalized and couldn't believe it. And they would criticize the Prophet of Islam. And until this very day, Muslims have no response because it is in their sources, but to retaliate with anger and rage and riot and so forth. Mm. 
So Muhammad rises to power, attracts a lot of followers by basically making it a holy calling to go out and raid and steal stuff from other tribes in, in Arabia. Uh, he dies in 632. And then the first of the eight battles that you, you summarize uh, occurs just a few years later in the year 636. Um, this is the Battle of Yarmouk. Uh, and forgive my pronunciation. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure. I'm, no, that's I'm, good. Yeah. That's fine. Um, so, what? How significant was was this battle? Right. Well, of the eight battles that I chronicle, in my opinion, Yarmouk was probably the most significant of all the battles. Certainly, the most decisive. So, even more because, than the fall of Constantinople. Oh yeah. I mean, really, the fall of Constantinople, as traumatic as it was for Eastern Europeans and, and Greek Christians and so forth, was more symbolic. It was more of a symbolic uh, a victory for Islam and loss for Christendom than anything else, because Constantinople was just surrounded by a sea of Islam at the time. You know, mm-hmm. all of the Balkans were already conquered by the Ottomans, um, but the holdout, surra- you know, that was surrounded by this sea of Islam was Constantinople. So it didn't really. The conquest of Constantinople had a massive symbolic demoralization effect on the Christian uh, world, the Eastern one especially, but it didn't really have that, uh, you know, a, a practical decisive effect on on outcomes, on the outcome or, or the subsequent outcomes okay. after that. Okay. Okay. But Yarmouk is the exact opposite. Yarmouk is one of these battles that virtually no one in the West has even heard of. Right. Um, but, but it happens in the year 636 and historians who have studied it well-known historians, I quote a couple in the book, um, they they describe it as the most consequential battle of all world history. So not even just between Islam and Europe, but really all of world history. And the reason for that is after the Arabs crushed the Eastern Roman Empire's army or the Byzantine Empire's armies in the by the river Yarmouk in Syria in 636, that essentially opened the floodgates for all the subsequent conquests because – the Byzantine Empire had, had marshaled up a massive army, and this was supposed to be it. This was supposed to be the decisive stroke that sends the Arabs reeling back to the peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula, and they failed. And after that, basically in a couple of years, uh, they swept westward from Syria, and they took Egypt in a couple of years, and then in another decade or so, uh, Libya was taken, to give it its modern-day um, name, and then in the, in the following decades, all of North Africa into Spain. So basically from Yarmouk, um, in less than a century after Yarmouk, and largely because of that loss, all of the Middle East, Syria, um, greater Syria, which really encompassed Palestine, Lebanon, all these areas, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco into Spain uh, were conquered because they couldn't be held back at that point. And what's more important is it, it wasn't just a conquest, you know. Um, a lot of times, for example, the uh, the Germanic conquerors uh, behind the fall of Rome mm-hmm. in the fifth fifth century and so forth, you know, they came and they conquered, but they were actually later assimilated into Roman culture, which at the time was Christian, and they learned the Latin alphabet, and they basically were assimilated into that. What happened um, to North Africa and Syria was the exact opposite. Not only were they conquered. But the conquerors imposed their language, their religion, Islam, language Arabic, and the culture onto all those peoples. And so the result is today, whereas Arabians, Arabs, and Arabia was once um, confined to the Arabian Peninsula, the language, the culture, the people. Today, when we say the Arab world, we're talking 22 countries, none of which were Arab to begin with. So Egypt and Syria had their own languages, uh, you know, Coptic, which is a descendant of Pharaonic for Egypt and, you know, Syriac and all the other variants of that language in Syria. And of course the Berbers and North Africa and so forth. So you had all these different peoples, most of whom were very much Christian. So in the seventh century, if you took, and this is the other pivotal point about the battle of Yarmouk in the seventh century, when this battle happened, if you took all the territory that made up what we call Christendom or the Christian world, okay, which is, which was then all of North Africa, Southwest Asia, and um, southwest of the Danube Rhine rivers, all of that was Christian. Um, after Yarmouk and, with, and within that few decades or uh, definitely less than a century, more than three quarters of that Christian original territory was forever conquered in the name of Islam. And so it's sort of ironic for me to hear today, for example, when I talk about Christian 
um, remnants in the Middle East who are being persecuted by Muslims in, in Egypt, in Syria, and elsewhere. And people will tell me, you know, we sympathize, but why did Christians go live in Muslim lands to start with? And it just, you know, it shows you the ignorance um, of the fact that actually Islam truncated uh, Western history, truncated Western civilization big time uh, with these conflicts. Quest and that today all these nations that we were we just think of as Arab and Muslim and so forth were actually part of the continuity of Western Christian history. In you know at the time of the seventh century, uh, the the heart of the Christian world, the heart of civilization, was in those areas that are today conquered by Islam, including Alexandria and Egypt, you know Damascus and Antioch and Syria, Constantinople of course, modern day Turkey. Um, you know, you had five Christian centers, five C's historically. Only one of them today is still Christian, Rome. Uh, all the other four were conquered permanently. So it's a bit ironic, you know, and it goes again to show you the, you know, the divorce in history in the Western, modern Western mentality that no one, you know, very few people understand or know this. And they just think Islam was always there. That area was always Arabic speaking and it was always Muslim, which is not the case, of course. Hmm. We're talking with Raymond Ibrahim about his book, Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West on a view from the bunker. Uh, how is it possible, Raymond, that this these armies coming out of Arabia, which was not a wealthy place, I mean, you can't really grow stuff there. I mean, you had the spice trade coming up the east side of the Persian Gulf or, or the Red Sea, uh, which, you know, the Nabataean kingdom uh, made them wealthy. Uh, the Romans, when they took it, uh, inherited that uh, money-making venture. But still, uh, it's not really a place where you've got a lot of natural resources like we were blessed with here in the United States. Um, how is it that they were able to overwhelm the remnant of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantines, in the first place? Well, that's a good question, and it's, um, you know, for modern academics, it's definitely a conundrum, because, like you said, uh, they shouldn't have won. Uh, they were under-equipped. Um, they didn't have military strategies the way the Byzantine Empire did, or, or for that matter, the neighboring Sasanian Persian Empire, um, and yet they won. And modern historians are in a pickle trying to explain it, and the reason for that is because they can only, uh, you know, in their framework, they can only resort to material explanations. Ah, okay. And, right? And materially, all the, you know, the enemies of Islam or their opponents, the Byzantines and the Persians, were materially stronger. But explaining this away was never a problem either for Muslim historians or Christian slash European historians up until very recently. And Muslim historians actually explained it by saying that, you know, the Muslim fighters, the jihadis, or as they're known in Arabic, the mujahideen, were basically inflamed to no end because they were offered a win-win scenario, as I, as I refer to it in the book, actually. The first scenario is you fight, you conquer, you get plunder and booty and slaves, okay? And the second scenario is you fight, but you don't conquer and you get killed. And then guess what? You get booty and plunder and slaves in heaven for in perpetuity for yeah, heaven for yeah. eternity um and you know that might sound flippant but the reality is um is the islamic notion of paradise is um inherently carnal it discusses you know men having carnal relations with supernatural celestial women who are mm -hmm. made by allah expressly for sexual purposes to prolong and heighten the pleasure mm -hmm. and, and i mean this is written in their books um, little boys are also circulated around, and that's in the Quran, mm -hmm. um, you know, a reference to pedophilia. They'll have gold and jewels. There'll be a lot of eating and gorging, and they'll be able to drink from rivers of wine, even though they're not supposed to drink alcohol now. Um, so, you know, and today a lot of people will hear that and will dismiss it as silly. But the fact is, is 7th century Arabs believed that passionately until this modern, you know, until now. When you read um, Islamic terrorists from the Islamic State and so forth, Al Qaeda, and you delve into their, you know, um, their own discussions, often in Arabic, as I do, um, this isn't usually uh, sent to the West or translated because it has no value. But online, I've heard and I've read about how they often talk about these things in the now, as if that's still going to happen, and they expect to be rewarded in paradise with unlimited, you know gorging on food and you know sex with supernatural women and so forth um now if you move up until recently even in the 1900s uh, i quote in the book in sword and scimitar a, a british general i think his name is glub 
who actually went to Arabia, you know, in the early 1900s and fought. And afterwards, he said, I can tell you as a person who actually um, commanded Arabic Muslim battalions that these people truly believe all this stuff and they will go fighting to the end and die because they expect to go and be rewarded with sex slaves in heaven and so forth. And if they don't die, like I said, it's a win-win. Then they get that sort of thing here in the now. And I think that is the most plausible explanation as to why um, an inherently and materially weak and economically weak Islamic Arab armies were able to overcome um, their counterparts in the West and so forth because they had that you know edge that made them very fanatical and we still see that edge today um, with the, when when you know a young man goes and blows himself up just to kill people in a church and he's convinced that in doing so he's going to go and be rewarded in paradise hmm. and there's no uh, the the other factor that isn't uh, considered by modern Western historians especially is uh, the uh, <laughs> the theology that uh, the Apostle Paul put very succinctly in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, you know, we're not wrestling against human opponents, but against principalities and powers and cosmic rulers over this present darkness. There's a spiritual aspect to this that we cannot really quantify because we don't see into that realm. But uh, I suspect that had something to do with this as well. Well, you know, just to add to that, um, you know, I'll tell you this, that and this is copiously documented in the book in Sword and Scimitar, but you know, for early Christians who confronted and dealt with Islam, they had no doubt. And by early, I mean, you know, from the seventh century, including people like John of Damascus, um, up until recently, okay, you know, up until the postmodern era, um, they were convinced that Muhammad was possessed diabolically, and that Islam was the religion of the beast, and that everything about it was set about to destroy the kingdom of God in the now on earth and to attack, you know, Christendom. So this was the default position for Christians all throughout Europe, uh, you know, from the seventh century up until, you know, the 1700s or the Enlightenment era and so forth. Um, No one had any doubt about that. And again, they would cite Islamic scriptures, um, including Muhammad being attacked by what he thought was a jinn, okay, and basically going into seizures and foaming at the mouth and falling down, um, before a revelation came to him, up until the fact that from the very from the start, Muslim armies would always have an abhorrence for Christian symbols and would destroy crosses, urinate on them, um, defecate on them. This comes out in the history, you know, burn churches just like we see today. Uh, so that's been going on for a long time. And for a lot of these early Christians, they were convinced that Satan was actually behind the religion of Islam. Hmm. Well, I can't say that I, I would argue with that assessment, but uh, <laughs> it, it is it, it is amazing how far we have we have come in uh, in the Western world uh, from from that point of view. Uh, let, let's skip ahead. You, you you deal with the first siege of Constantinople, which was a, a setback for for uh, Islam. But uh, I, I want to set that aside because coming to the, the Battle of Tours, I think it's really shocking for us in the West who've forgotten all of this history. Um, how much of an impact Islam had even on Western Europe uh, until you know, relatively recently in our history. But it, within 100 years, this is what I find astonishing. Within 100 years of the death of Muhammad, not only had Spain been overrun, but uh, the forces of Islam had basically taken the, the, uh, the Mediterranean coast of, of France and were making inroads into France. And it, was, it took Charles Martel to turn back uh, Islam at, at Tours. How did uh, Islam get that far, and what did Martel do that was different from what uh, the Visigoths in Spain uh, had had done? Yeah, those are good questions. Uh, So in the year 711, Islam had conquered the whole of North Africa, as we were discussing, uh, post post the Battle of Yarmouk in 632, and um, then they invaded into Spain. Um, And at this point, you still had an Arabic core at the center of the army, but it was also, you had a lot of Berbers, North Africans, who had become Islamicized at this point. Um, because the Berbers, it's if you look into their history, and I, I talk about this in chapter one, but they, you know, they fought pretty fiercely um, for their freedom against Islam. But in the end, you know, they just converted and they all became Muslims. It was a sort of, if you can't beat them, join them mentality. Mm-hmm. Because the Berbers themselves were very tribal and they engaged in the sorts of things that Islam you know, had deified, which is basically warfare on the other, 
who's not one of us and, you know, enslavement, plunder and so forth. But so this vast host of Berbers and Muslims and Arabs went into Spain. Um, it eventually collapsed very quickly um, after one of the battles at a river, Guadalajara River in the south. And um, it was run by the Visigoths, basically the Western Goths, who were Christian at the time. Um, and the reason why they collapsed uh, so fast, you know, varies. Some people say there was dissensions within the Visigothic um, army, which is very plausible. Um, <clears throat> and and, others, and other reasons come up. Um, but then when they went in, um, when they went in after that, they kept moving northward and they crossed into, like you were saying, into France. And they had basically the coast of, of all of France conquered and the atrocities, you should see them. And, you know, I, I record them in Sword and Scimitar, but a lot of other um, you know, earlier primary sources record them and I quote from them. And it was just, you know, mass slaughter, mass enslavement, destruction of churches, uh, plundering of churches, the usual. And basically, um, at this point, by the year 732, under the leadership of Abdul Rahman, um, an Arab Muslim, they were making, uh, it says, about 80,000 uh, strong army started heading towards Tours. Uh, to plunder the basilica of the saint of the same name, and it was supposed to be one of the you know rich, richest shrines full of you know gold and so forth, and that's where they were headed. And finally, Charles, the Hammer, quote unquote, Martel. And that's where the title of Martel comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, he was essentially the king uh, at the time. You know, they call they call him the mayor of the palace, but he was a king. And he finally rallied a lot of his men and they went and they met and they had the Battle of Tours in the year 732, which ironically is the year Muhammad died. So we're talking only one century after the death of Muhammad. And as I was saying, three quarters of the Christian world is now conquered and Islam is in the heart of Europe, right in the heart of uh, France. Yeah, Tours is and, not on the coast. I mean, Tours is about two thirds yeah. of the way. If you're going you know, from south to north, it's about two thirds of the way to the British Channel, the English right. Channel. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they had a very bloody uh, a battle, which is you know, recounted in detail in the book. Um, and eventually, uh, you know, after just one day of hard fighting, the, the Franks prevailed and the Muslims just flee back south uh, behind the, you know, behind the mountain chain border between Iberia and, and the mainland Europe, uh, France. And, were, and then they stayed, of course, there. We can talk about that later for centuries in Spain. But, you know, the decisiveness and the importance of that battle was always well known historically. And even someone like Edward Gibbon, who's, you know, decidedly secular and you can tell he's very anti-church, anti-Christianity, um, said that had Charles Martel and the Franks not been able to withstand the Muslims, we, meaning we here in England, uh, would be reciting the Quran in Oxford University. And, you know, today when you hear that, it sounds funny and people don't believe it. But the reality, like I said, um, you know, really comes to you when you realize that countries like Egypt and Syria and Turkey and Libya and all these places were actually more Christian than Europe. And look at them today. Today, no one even thinks of them as having any Christian background. So what, what would have stopped that from happening into, in England, you know, if, uh, if, if uh, Charles Martel and his, and his men didn't prevail? Uh, because they were the supreme military force of Europe at the time, the Franks, the Frankish Empire. And if they would have also folded under the, you know, the force of Islam, there's no reason to believe any other uh, West uh, European element would have able to withstand him, the, the Muslim juggernaut. Now, you think about that and uh, realize that, uh, again, Tours in France is not near the coast. Islam was halfway to making it to the English Channel. And the core of Europe was under threat from Islamic armies for about the next 900 years. Think about that. 732 A.D., Charles Martel turned the Muslims back at Tours. And the final battle inside Europe with the forces of Islam, major battle, took place after some of my ancestors are already on this uh, new continent called North America. <laughs> Our conversation is going to continue. How important to Western history was Charles the Hammer, Charles Martel, and how did Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation almost turn Europe Muslim? Raymond Ibrahim is our guest. His new book, Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. And our conversation continues next on A View from the Bunker.
cutting-edge analysis of end times prophecy on the very ground where it all unfolds. It's the Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel, May 12th through 23rd, 2019, hosted by Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Pastor Carl Gallup's best-selling author of Gods and Thrones and Gods of Ground Zero, Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat of Messiah of Israel Ministries, and filmmakers Justin and Wes Fall, producers of the Hollow Earth Chronicles. This is a once-in-a-lifetime tour of the Holy Land from Mount Hermon to the Dead Sea. You'll walk in Jesus' footsteps on the battlegrounds of the supernatural war with preaching and teaching along the way. Shiloh, Bethel, Mount Carmel, Nazareth, the Jordan River, the Mount of Olives, Sea of Galilee, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jerusalem, where the final battle will be fought for God's Mount of Assembly, Zion. The Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel. Reserve your place now. For information and registration, log on to LipkinTours.com. That's LipkinTours.com. Jack the Ripper's dark deeds actually began long before 1888. And it wasn't a mere man who committed the crimes, but a demon in league with devilish men, a group of men called Red Wing. Only one small group of valiant men and women stand against this evil, a group that place their faith in Christ alone. And they protect a secret, a secret of blood that Red Wing hopes to use to usher in the reign of Antichrist and the end of day. Red Wing is called Red Wing because they want to kill the church. They mm-hmm. want to forever stop Christ from coming back. So it's the Holy Spirit, the dove, mm-hmm. with a murdered, a, a, a has been slain, yeah. a wounded mm. dove. Ultimately, we still have to remember that the one who is in control is God Almighty, and we have to go to him, and we have to suit up every time we go out. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. Book one. Blood Lies. Book two. Blood Rights. Book three. The Blood is the Life. Book four. Realms of Stone. And coming soon, book five. Realms of Fire. Available at skywatchtvstore.com. And paperback and Kindle at amazon.com. Characters you'll love and a story you can't put down. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. One man, one microphone, and a psychological need to tell the world what he thinks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. We are living in the most prophetic time since the first century. So says our friend, Pastor Carl Gallops, and we agree. Coming up in our final segment tonight, in just about 30 minutes, we will talk about the Sanhedrin. It is back together. They've got the band back together. And tomorrow... They're holding a consecration ceremony for the stone altar for the third temple. That's coming up in our final segment tonight uh, with the Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat, an interview recorded earlier this week via Skype from Tel Aviv. But now we return our guest, Raymond Ibrahim, author of the new book, Sword and Scimitar. So, How long of a setback did, did uh, the, the Franks and Charles Martel uh, set the, uh, the, the Islamic world? I mean, there was a point it, it, somewhere af- after the 8th century where um, Arabs no longer led the, the charge of Islam uh, against the West. Uh, w- w- did, the, did the Franks have something to do with that, or was there something else that, that occurred there that uh, kind of transferred the leadership of the Islamic world from the Arabs to the Turks? Well, basically, the Islamic Empire, and you know, the first one really is the Umayyad. It's known as the Umayyad Empire, which reigned sometime from like 661 uh, AD till about 750. So that's when most of the conquests take place that we're discussing. Um, it was a predatory uh, caliphate, which means it's all of its wealth uh, consisted entirely on plunder. Of both, um, you know, animate and inanimate, inanimate objects. Animate, of course, being human slaves. Mm. Um, and they got this through that long march all throughout North Africa into Spain and into France. Now, once that halted up in France, and Islam was now confined in Spain and basically North Africa, and uh, they couldn't get any further than the walls of Constantinople in the east. And we can talk about that later. Basically. Um, in the 8th and 9th century, what you had, and this is a very lo- little-known epic, um, is a massive, bombard- piratical Islamic jihad raids throughout the Mediterranean. 
okay, and all the European nations, Italy and, uh, you know, all, all the coasts, of the Balkans and Greece and so forth, were continuously bombarded and all the islands, Crete and, you know, Sardinia and Sicily and all these, and, and Malta were all actually occupied and it's unknown how many Europeans were enslaved, but it was countless. The Arabs actually, you know, after tours, they actually managed to get into Switzerland and had a base in Switzerland. Wow. From which, yeah, from which they would send out slave raiding parties to capture white Europeans and send them and sell them in North Africa. So that's a that's a little known uh, aspect of history and numbers are very hard to find. <laughs> but it was a continuous, constant bombardment. And then finally, as you were saying, it starts fizzling out and you have a new caliphate that comes, the Abbasids, who's a little more Persian than they are Arabic. Um, and, you know, there's more of a consolidation in the Islamic Empire. And there's something of a reprieve for Europe. Uh, you know, Constantinople as the arch enemy still gets attacked annually, you know, twice every year and so forth as required. But eventually <laughs> you now have a move from the Arabs to the Turks. So the Turks are originally brought as slave soldiers, and a lot of these Arab uh, or Muslim empires were completely run by or, or were completely supported by slave soldiers who were brought in, brain, you know, Islamized, brainwashed, indoctrinated, and turned into jihadis, and then let loose against Islam's enemies. Um, so <clears throat> really, if you want to talk about it, the, the pivotal battle I discussed, the fourth battle um, at, the, at the hands of the Turks is the Battle of Manzikert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which happens in the year 1071, and it's pivotal because now you got these Turks um, under the Seljuk Empire, and Seljuk is just the name of one of their you know, forefathers, um, and they're all Muslim, they're all pious, at least according to Islamic records, but they all invade Eastern Europe in the context of jihad, giving Christians three choices, convert, pay jizya, tribute, or live, or war. Um, and then they finally defeat the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 um, at the hands of Alp Arslan, who's known as – which means – it's a Turkish title, which means a courageous lion. But I call him Muhammad because his real name was Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And it's important to keep in mind uh, you know, the roots of the conflict. Um, so he's victorious. The first Roman emperor in over a thousand years is actually taken captive during this battle, Romanist Diogenes. Um, and it's a very interesting battle, actually, when you look at it and all the machinations involved and treachery, et cetera, et cetera. But underneath all that, you have the, the like I said, the usual divide. You're an infidel. This is Islam. We're coming to take your nation. You have three choices, et cetera, et cetera. After this battle, all of Anatolia, which is still a part of the Christian world and especially the Byzantine Empire, Anatolia being modern day Turkey, was conquered by the Seljuks and it brought them all the way up to Constantinople. Um, uh, just 2,500 feet away. And um, what's important about that battle is, uh, you know, the rise of the Turks, because now they become the new standard bearers of Islam. The Arabs, the Persians, they kind of go on the retreat. Arabic is the language of Islam and so forth. But it, the new fighters and new jihadis are always now Turks or under the leadership of Turks. And, uh, you know, really the most important aspect for our purposes about this battle of Manzikert is after that battle in 1071, as I was saying, they conquered the whole of Anatolia. According to the primary sources, hundreds and of thousands of Christians living in Anatolia were butchered and slaughtered. Thousands of churches were set aflame and, hund and hundreds of thousands of more Christians were enslaved and sent into Eastern slavery. And that right there is the reason why the Crusades which is the next chapter in Sword and Scimitar, yeah. happened. Because the Byzantine emperor, Alexius, seeing what was going on and, and just how threatened his entire empire was and what was happening to his people, implored the pope, uh, Pope Urban II, for aid and telling him, you know, if you don't, if you don't help us, next they're going to be coming for you because we're the eastern bulwark of the Christian world. And that was the, the reason of the Crusades. That's why it happened when it happened. And yet today when you listen to all these apologists that we were mentioning earlier – they present the Crusades in a vacuum. Um, they don't tell you that Muslims were butchering Christians left and right, hundreds of thousands of them. They present it as if uh, people like John Esposito, a, you know, academic from Georgetown, and I quote him in the book. He says something like, five centuries of peaceful coexistence passed. 
until, you know, imperial popes and greedy knights came up with a pretext to go and colonize the Islamic <laughs> world. <laughs> you see, so this is the, this is that great disconnect that we're talking about between what really happened, which sheds light on what's happening today, and the lies that just proliferate both about the past and the present. It, it is astonishing. And you, meant, you mentioned 2,500 feet away. Now, that, uh, is that correct? Because Constantinople was on the west side of the uh, strait there and uh, the, the Turks. <clears throat> yeah, 2,500 feet away from, uh, 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 from the narrowest point of the strait. Okay. Uh, and so the uh, Turks had basically taken all of, all of uh, Anatolia, ancient Asia Minor, mm-hmm. and uh, then left the uh, Byzantines just holding the, the western side, uh, right. the side closest to uh, Greece. Okay. Um, so Pope Urban then puts out a call, and uh, what what? Uh, yeah, because you're right, you know, Raymond. It does seem that, uh, and again, as somebody who's had an interest in history, and maybe not this period of history, but uh, what what little I've read always seems to paint the, uh, the 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 Crusades as as wars of conquest, and and they went slaughtering and pillaging, and they just indiscriminately killed these poor Muslims and Jews in every city they came to. Uh, is kind of the the impression that I was left with, but in reading your book mm-hmm. Sword and Scimitar, I, I get a very different picture um, and, and a very different well, justification for the call to war by the men of the West. Mm-hmm. Well, see, and that's that's exactly it. In in the book in Sword and Scimitar, as we, as we were saying, there's eight battles that I focus on. In reality, the Crusades, all of them, pale in significance to any of these battles, and yet we know and we've heard about the Crusades repeatedly even though we haven't re- heard of so many of these battles, like Yarmouk, as I was saying, mm-hmm. and so forth. And the question is, well, why are the Crusades so famous in the West, whereas all these other important battles, much more important battles that I that I delineate in the book, are a lot of them aren't even known. And the reason is because the Crusades is the only battle where you actually have Christians and Europeans marching onto Muslim land. And so de facto, they can instantly be made to look like the aggressors, the bad guys, the violent ones. Okay, so whereas all the other battles that I discuss, you have Muslims marching into European territory, which is hard for the apologists to explain away. You know, Mm -hmm. what's bringing Muslims into Constantinople? What's bringing them into France and Spain and so forth? In the in, in a in a superficial sense, they can present the Crusades as, oh, well, look, they, the Christians, left Europe. And entered Muslim land and created atrocities. And so on the surface and within a vacuum, it looks like the Crusaders are the bad guys. And I believe that is the main reason why the Crusades are so famous, are so well known, as opposed to these much more important encounters, military encounters between Muslims and Christians that had massive de- – and they didn't even – the Crusades didn't even have a decisive um, uh, impact on this history that I'm discussing. They basically managed to take Jerusalem – and, and all these other cities along the coast, Eastern Mediterranean, for a century or two, and then they just lost them back to Islam, which mm-hmm. had them. So it didn't even change the status quo at all. But they're famous because they're fodder to be used against Western civilization, against Christianity, and so forth. And say, as Barack Hussein Obama uh, once did, you know, who are we to judge and don't get on your, you know, don't get on your high horse and start talking about what Muslims <laughs> are doing because remember what people did in the Crusades and so forth. I honestly think that's the main reason the Crusades are still so popular. Hmm. We're talking with uh, Raymond Ibrahim about his book Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West on a View from the Bunker. Um, one of the things that comes out in, in your book, and I know we're going to skip over some of the battles here probably, but uh, that's okay, because I would like people to get your book and, and read it, because it's, it's, it's eye-opening. Um, w- one of the, the uh, themes that comes through is the disunity, and you, you mentioned this a bit in, in relation to the Battle of Manzikert, but it, it shows up again and again how um, the disunity amongst Western Christians, uh, you know, these nobles are, are jealous of this guy because he might become too powerful and, and get above his raisin. Or, you know, this guy, the, the, uh, the, the French go into battle first because they don't like the Hungarians or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, how much of a role, how important was that in the West's inability to stand up to Islam over these centuries? It was definitely a role. Um, it's hard to say, you know, how important of a role it was. It was definitely, I would put it as, you know, one of the big five roles, at least, uh, that contributed. And it got a lot worse um, in more recent times. So it wasn't as bad 
you know, in the seventh and eighth century as it was in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, for example. Um, and a lot of that had to do. A lot of them uh, had to do with the schisms. Okay, so first, of course, you have the Catholic Orthodox schism, and then you know you have Catholics sacking Constantinople um, in 1204 and so forth. Which, by the way, is kind of an exaggerated um, also account. Which I, you know, a lot of historians have discussed. Uh, you can look into, you know, Thomas Madden has written about it. Um, you know, the the whys and the who and how it happened. It's it's as you can imagine the. Catholic crusader sack of Constantinople is one of the favorite themes of the apologists for Islam. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of it is really distorted and exaggerated. But anyway, so you definitely have that. And there was an animosities because of that and so forth. Um, So when Constantinople was being attacked by Islam, you know, Catholics and Orthodox Catholics, some, some, a lot of Catholics came to help actually. Um, But, you know, other Catholics wouldn't, and the Orthodox themselves didn't want the help of Catholics. So you definitely had that there. But it really reached the high point, I think, with the uh, Protestant Reformation, um, <clears throat> with Martin Luther. And, and you know, that, that comes out in the book a lot. Yeah, um, that was something I had never considered. And it just kind of pointed out to me how how uh, skewed my view of history is because I had never considered the possibility that Martin Luther, as you mentioned in the book, Sword and Scimitar, uh, basically nailed his his theses on the the Württemberg door at the worst possible time because it divided Christendom at a point when Islam uh, and and the Ottoman Empire was getting ready to launch a major assault right into the heart of Europe. (laughs) Right. And he actually told his followers, you know, don't don't help the Catholics against the Turks, because what are the Turks doing? But you know, filling heaven with real Christians, if the Catholics they kill are real Christians. And if they're not, well, well, that's God's judgment to kill them. And he really took a very passive position towards Islam and one that we can arguably say was somewhat favorable. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. He still, like most Christians, saw Islam as a false religion and Muhammad as the beast and the Antichrist and all that. But it's interesting because, you know, my enemy – or the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that principle was very much on display in the whole Protestant Catholic schism. Because at, the, at that time, in the 1500s with Martin Luther, um, you have the Holy, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the Catholic Empire, and so forth, fighting against the Ottoman, the Turks. And north of that, you have the Protestant Revolution in Germany and so forth. So really, on the, in, the, in the southeast, you got Islam. In the northwest, you got the Protestants. And in the middle, you got the Catholics. And a lot of the propaganda that came out from the Protestants was so anti-Catholic that it basically, it, it, in order to make Catholics look good, it had to apologize for Islam and portray Islam and Muslims almost as the good guys. And it's interesting because this sort of relativism and kind of you know citing Catholic atrocities to minimize uh, you know what Islam is doing is with us till this day. Oh yeah, and it started and it started then, and I also find it um, kind of interesting that it's especially well ingrained in historically Protestant nations, okay? Because you, you, if, you, if you look today at Europe or the West in general, you know, which nations have this sort of, you know, <laughs> naive, you know, appreciation and, and, and outlook about Islam? It's really historically Protestant nations, you know, Northwest Europe, yeah. Scandinavia, right. Britain, Germany, you know, the United States to a lesser extent, Australia – you don't see this sort of thing in Eastern Europe, okay, which is mostly Orthodox and also Catholic. Right, right. Um, and, and yeah, so I think this thing, had this sort of the enemy of my enemy is my friend has spilled over up until today. And it's one of the chief reasons that we still, you know, in, in the collective consciousness of the Western nations, Islam is kind of the good guy because the real bad guy is the Catholics. I've noticed in the news that the, uh, the president of Hungary, uh, is it uh, Orban, is, yeah, uh, yeah he, he, he seems to be... Uh, uh, a little out of step with the uh, the welcoming uh, attitude of, of Merkel and uh, Macron when it comes to these uh, so-called uh, 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 refugees that have been flooding into Europe over the last year, couple of years. And after reading what uh, they went through, what uh, Hungary has been through, through in its history, it's it's easier to understand now why he's got a different approach to this problem than the Germans, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and and so forth. Uh, and by the way. Uh, as I have some Swedish ancestry, um, <laughs> ancestors who only came over in the 19th century from Sweden, in fact, uh, I was a little shocked to learn that uh, the Vikings and the raids of the Vikings were motivated by the uh, demand for European slaves from the Islamic world. 
Well, see, you know, when one really pries into the true history of Islam, especially vis-a-vis the West and Europe and Christendom, as opposed to, you know, I have no other way to call it, but the lies being propagated, including from schools and universities, you find out just how um, integral Islam was to the bombardment of the Christian world in the medieval era. So as you're saying, you know, any student who studies the um, the ninth century especially will be told, oh, Europe was attacked by three different invaders. From the south came the Moors, by which they mean the Muslims. Um, from the east uh, came, you know, these various Turkic tribes. And from the north came the, the Vikings. Well, you come to find out that when you look at the, the treasure hoards of the Vikings all throughout Scandinavia, they're just littered with Arabic gold coins. Oh, wow. um, and, and, you know, so what did, what is it that Vikings had to offer um, to the Arab world? Well, it was actually white slaves that they took from Britain and Ireland mm-hmm. and all throughout the European coast. That's actually why there was this massive um, slave raids that went on. It wasn't so much for the Vikings themselves, but it was because they would take it and they would go down the uh, the Russian uh, river I'm forgetting is the Volga and go to the Black Sea mm-hmm. where where the where Muslims uh, you know for long had um, slave markets there and they would sell you know all these hundreds of thousands of slaves and get tons and tons of gold that's the only thing that the the Muslim worlds were buying from them you know, the secondary thing they bought from them was things like furs and so when you read the apologetic accounts they always say you know the Vikings sold you know, slaves and furs to the Muslims. <laughs> Though it's hard to imagine that the furs was really that much. It's a lot harder to capture a fox than it is to capture a lot of, you know, humans yeah, uh, in, yeah. a, in a church, okay? Um, so for sure, it, it, some historians argue that if it wasn't for the uh, Muslim demand for white-skinned slaves, the entire Viking phenomena would not even have happened. Wow, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, again, there, there, are, there are many more questions I, I want to pose to you here, but uh, you know, want to be uh, you know sensitive to your time, uh, and and again, want to leave something for for readers to to dig into when they get the book Sword mm-hmm. and Scimitar, um, the the Siege of Vienna. Uh, in 1683, this is this is something else that I th- that really astonishes me because when you look at a map, first of all, you realize that Vienna is not really near Southern Europe. It's really way up there. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's like in the yeah. middle of Europe, and this was the second time that uh, the forces of Islam had uh, besieged Vienna, trying to uh, trying to take that city because it was essentially a gateway to the rest of uh, rest of Europe. You go north, you got uh, Poland and Germany, and uh, you go south, you got Italy, and uh, you know a, a pathway through to France. Um, and, and 1683, I mean 1683. I've got ancestors on my father's side that had been in this country long enough to have two generations of kids by the time the Muslims were at the gates of Vienna in 1683. How close were they to actually taking Vienna? Well, they were very close, but I mean, you know, more to the point, 1683, we are now well over a thousand years of Islamic jihads on Christian Europe. And in 1683, the largest Islamic army came. It was uh, reportedly, according to the sources, and this is a conservative estimate because some sources give even more, but 300,000 people came under the Ottoman command and encircled Vienna. Um, you know, and once again, it was the same story. They had three choices, convert to Islam, pay jizya, live as tributaries and so forth, or fight to the death. Um, and, you know, that death almost came because they were, Vienna was besieged um, for almost two months. And so many people inside the city were dying from plague and dysentery and just starvation um, until finally, the relief forces led under the uh, Polish king, Jan or John Sobieski, uh, came and they had a very massive, uh, you know, decisive clash, decisive battle on September 12th, which, you know, just defeated the, the, the Muslims. And, and um, not only did they defeat them and the Muslims left, but that really is the turning point. That's the eighth of the big, big battles that I discuss, because after that, the Ottomans who had been a scourge uh, to Eastern Europe, for centuries, started slowly retreating from all their holdings, including the Balkans um, and so forth. But it's important to you know keep in mind that while that while I discuss in Sword and Scimitar the major battles, I also talk about a few of the little smaller ones. Right. And so you know, let's move it. You know, we can cap it off now with talking about the United States and yeah. its first encounter with Islam. Okay, and it actually happened before the United States had time to even vote for its first president. 
So right after the United States, uh, um, you know, declared independence and broke away from Great Britain, once it broke away from Great Britain, uh, it was no longer protected by Great Britain's jizya payments to the Muslim Barbary pirates in and, North and Africa. Ex- explain that word jizya for people not I familiar. Will. Yep. I will. So basically, according to Islamic uh, Islamic doctrine, teaching and terminology, jizya is uh, if you're a if you're a non-Muslim and you wish to live in peace and not be killed, but uh, but but also live according to second class uh, citizenship. If you are literally living under Islamic rule, you have to pay what's called jizya, and this is founded on Quran Surah nine verse. 29, 929, and uh, it basically it's extortion money. If you pay X amount of money, however however much is demanded from you, you're free to be a Christian, a Jew, whatever, and you, we won't kill you is the, the mentality. And so you had all these r- r- barb, these pirates all throughout North Africa were just attacking any ship they could find that was Christian from Europe in the Mediterranean, anything that came in the Mediterranean. And by the way, you know, we always hear about slavery and you know, Europe and racism and, 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 and we should, but it needs to be balanced by understanding that in the 15, 16, 1700s, Muslims in the Mediterranean and also up in the Crimea, uh, which were attacking the Slavic peoples, enslaved something like six million people just in those two, three centuries. Six, six million, million uh, Christian Europeans. Wow. Okay? Wow. Um, yeah. And so when America declared independence, uh, Britain was paying jizya was paying tribute to these northern pirates, uh, North African pirates. And once America broke away, it was no longer covered because it was no, no longer part of Great Britain. And once the Muslims knew that, they started attacking American vessels, enslaving them, parading them through the streets of Algiers and so forth, killing them, torturing them. Um, and finally, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, these two men who are the product of the Enlightenment mm-hmm. and who had never heard of something called Islam – um, met with the um, the, the uh, ambassador of Tripoli to try to release you know the remaining soldiers or sailors, <laughs> and they asked him, "Why are you doing this? What have we done? You know, we haven't done anything to your people. We haven't provoked war, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And it's in the book, the full quote. It's in Sword and Scimitar. But the ambassador replies and says, "According to our prophet and our holy book, the Quran, anyone who doesn't believe in Allah is our enemy, and we can kill them, enslave them, rape them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And you know, it's it's funny to me, you know, someone like Jefferson and Adams, you know, who who wrote the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and we're talking about, you know, uh, the innate freedom of humanity. What they must have thought to hear this mm-hmm. kind of backwards talk. Um, but that's your first actual. And then war was eventually, if you've heard of the Barbary Wars, we right. discuss them in the book. That's what the origins of the Barbary Wars were. And they went in, in American navies. The navy was actually founded specifically to go and fight these Muslim uh, North African states. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's the founding of the American Navy right there. Um, and, and so it's, it, you know, to cap it all off here, we've talked now almost 14 centuries of nonstop warfare all of which is identified, articulated the way ISIS, the Islamic State, uh, articulates it, which is your infidels, and blah, blah, blah. We have three choices to kill you, et cetera. And yet here we are, such is the ignorance, such is the discontinuity in knowledge that we're sitting around talking about why do they hate us? What are they doing? Why, are the, why is this happening? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And that just shows you how utterly ignorant um, you know, people in the West have become, and I think intentionally so this is designed you know this hidden history so people can you know adopt all these other policies like you know open door and migration for muslims and so forth uh but it's going on and it's it's an old story and it's still repeating itself and anyone who still doesn't get it needs to really educate themselves absolutely one of the things that i I read recently which struck me as just the height of irony uh, regarding the enlightenment was the uh, the opinion of a scholar that the Greek philosophy on which the Enlightenment, that, that kind of sparked the Enlightenment, was kept out of Western Europe because it was too dangerous to get from Constantinople to the courts of, of Western Europe until the fall of Constantinople. And these uh, refugees from the fall of, yeah. you basically brought their books with them and suddenly, oh, hey, wow, this is a great idea. And that Enlightenment has led to the uh, indomining of the Western world and our uh, oblivious, uh, our, our complete uh, obliviousness to to uh, the threat of Islam today. 
Right. Well, the Enlightenment, and if you trace it to its earlier origins, you know, the Renaissance, which starts in Italy, it starts, coincidentally enough, right, when all these aristocratic Greeks flee the Constant, flee Constantinople after the, uh, the sack, and they go to Italy, and they bring with them all this new knowledge. But of course, you know, Enlightenment and Renaissance, you know, a la 16th century, via 16th century is not Enlightenment today. Okay, I mean, today mm-hmm. it's postmodernism, relativism, right, right, right. whatever. So, you know, the former Enlightenment, you know, it had, it had its merits for sure. But of course, as usual, it's sort of metastasized into something that's rather ill. What role uh, did the Janissaries play in uh, the spread of, of Islam? And what were the Janissaries? Well, the Janissaries, Janissaries to me are, um, <laughs> you know, recorded history's first Stockholm Syndrome victims. Mm-hmm. And what they were was basically the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, would after they would conquer, a, a, you know, any this or that particular Balkan region, they would place a le- levy on it, uh, whereby uh, families didn't have to pay. Remember the jizya, the tribute, the money. Now it had to be paid in their own flesh, in their own sons. So basically, the Ottoman, the Turks would go to all these Christian cities and take the healthiest, the handsomest, the strongest, the smartest boys, take them back home forcefully convert them to Islam, indoctrinate them in jihad, and then raise them uh, in a very Spartan, a go-gay type system where they would just be deprived food and beaten and disciplined and it was very harsh and austere. And they would, in the end, if they survived it, they would actually emerge as the most ferocious jihadi of history. And then they would take them, irony of ironies, and unloose them on their former family. And then they would perpetuate the cycle because these Janissaries, these former Christian boys, would go and conquer, you know, this or that Christian regions, and then it would start all over again. And they would go and seize X amount of Christian boys and reconvert them. So it also had a demographic uh, jihadi aspect uh, to it. And you know, but and here we go again. If you want to hear about the apologetics, because to Western, how do Western uh, academics justify this basic, the system of basically abducting boys? Many of them were, by the way, raped and sexually, I mean, basically sodomized and all sorts of things. And this comes out repeatedly in the sources and in Sword and Scimitar and document it. Um, but it was a very horrible thing. And women, the moms would be crying, holding onto their sons. Some of the fathers would protest and get killed. But today, uh, academics portray it, this Janissary system as basically the equivalent of a medieval Harvard scholarship. Why? Because the boys that would be taken would, would leave – you know, their poor peasant families behind and then they would be raised in this, you know, powerful Ottoman Empire and they would raise, you know, they, they would go up to the top and be very rich and prosperous and, you know, respected warlords. And, mm. and that's how it's being presented today in colleges. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. Raymond Ibrahim is the author of the book Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. Raymond, if you had to pick one of the um, the heroes of the West that you uh, – that you characterize or, or that you uh, profile in, in your book uh, as somebody that we could really, really use today? Who, who might that be? Ah, there's actually quite a few in the book because you, you had a lot, a lot of sober minded thinkers. Uh, and of course, things like political correctness and relativism just didn't exist. So mm-hmm. you had people, you know, but um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, I, I like uh, John Sobieski, mm-hmm. the Polish. Polish king, and I think he's also relevant because he's the closest to our times as opposed to the earlier battle, 1683, Siege of Vienna. I mean, he called it a holy war. He saw it for what it was. He didn't think these guys were coming because, you know, they're poor migrants or they have grievances. He said they're coming because they're out to destroy Christianity um, and they're motivated by a diabolical animus and so forth. And by the way, a lot of the other, you know, Christian emperors and fighters said the same thing. Uh, But, you know, we're lucky to have a lot of um, his uh, words actually preserved as opposed to the earlier emperors. Uh, Another one I like who's very little known is Leo the third. And he's the Byzantine emperor. And he's in in the seventh century. He had what I would call a very refreshing interfaith dialogue with the caliph Uthman um, uh, or, or actually, I'm sorry, Omar, Omar the second. Um, an interfaith dialogue because Omar called on him to convert to Islam, called on Leo, the emperor, and Leo responded in a long letter 
<laughs> and he just called out all the flaws of Islam that we were discussing in a very honest, open way, you know, not to mock Islam, but basically saying, you know, how can you believe in this prophet who was a pedophile, um, you know, whose claim to fame is that he was able to conquer and destroy and kill and so forth. So I think a lot of the you know proponents of interfaith dialogue can learn something from Leo the Third. Hmm. What do you hope readers take away from Sword and Scimitar? Well, basically, uh, you know, the the working question that I had when I first started writing this book is, is the Islamic State Islamic or not? And I decided, you know what, I'm not going to take the easy way and answer it from a theological point of view by quoting the Quran or the Hadith or the words of Muhammad, which all of which, of course, support violence and jihad. I said, I'm going to put that away because it's abstract. And let's look at what Muslims have said to and done in the West historically, which is harder to do. And that's so that's what I did. And I documented it. And I think when you see what Muslims have said to and done in the West for literally 14 centuries and you find out that it's a perfect duplicate of what ISIS is doing, except it was even more exponential because you had a lot more people involved, massive armies and, you know, massive, decisive cataclysmic battles. Then I think the question of does ISIS is ISIS Islamic or not becomes really silly and the answer is yes, of course, it's is is it's is Islamic. It's following in the footsteps of its forebears and so forth in in a very unwavering way. And if anything, it's more Islamic than so many other Muslim people. And I know there's peaceful Muslims and so forth, and I'm not discounting that. But ISIS is more emblematic and more representative of historic Islam over a millennium of it than you know the local moderate Muslim that works down the street in 7-Eleven who I, you know, joke around with in the morning. Hmm. And we met quite a few in uh, Jerusalem and uh, other cities on our tour of Israel uh, in back in May who would just as soon live peacefully alongside the Israelis without, uh, uh, right. you know, getting involved in the in the stuff that uh, Hamas is stirring up uh, in Gaza. Yeah. But, uh, right. yeah, your, your book uh, really makes it clear that, um, if anything, the Islamic State is a purer form of Islam than um, what we are being told by the media here in the West. And uh, I appreciate you writing the book, appreciate you taking time to talk about it. Uh, the book is Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West. Raymond Ibrahim, Ibrahim is, the, uh, is the author. His website, RaymondIbrahim.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. And uh, Raymond, really enjoyed the conversation. I'd like to do it again sometime. Likewise, Derek. Thanks for having me. Raymond Ibrahim's website is RaymondIbrahim.com. There'll be a link to that in the show notes as well at VFTB.net or wherever else you find the podcast. Subscribe to his um, subscribe to his blog, his website, and every time he posts a new article, which is a couple of times a week, you'll get an email notification. And it's worth getting those notifications because everything he puts up on the web is worth reading. It will be disturbing but better to be informed than caught by surprise. You read the documented history that he chronicles, and you learn very quickly that um, (laughs) there's nothing we can do short of submit that will make violent Islamists leave us alone. But as Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, well, as he titled his, his book a couple of years ago, never submit. We are literally dealing with a clash of civilizations. And Linda Sarsour and the Council on American-Islamic Relations are playing the game a lot better than we are. And isn't it pathetic, pathetic, that this administration of the U.S. Army War College is more concerned about what Linda Sarsour thinks of them than about teaching our soldiers the history of war between Islam and and the Christian West. Well, we'll see what they think of my next book when that comes out. We'll tell you a little more about that and where you can see us for the rest of 2019 when A View from the Bunker wraps up right after this. Jack the Ripper's dark deeds actually began long before 1888. And it wasn't a mere man who committed the crimes, but a demon in league with devilish men, a group of men called Red Wing. Only one small group of valiant men and women stand against this evil, a group that place their faith in Christ alone. And they protect a secret, 
a secret of blood that Red Wing hopes to use to usher in the reign of Antichrist and the end of day. Red Wing is called Red Wing because they want to kill the church. They Mm -hmm. want to forever stop Christ from coming back. So it's the Holy Spirit, the dove, Mm -hmm. with a murdered, has been slain, a wounded Mm. dove. Ultimately, we still have to remember that the one who is in control is God Almighty, and we have to go to him, and we have to suit up every time we go out. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. Book one. Blood Lies. Book two. Blood Rights. Book three. The Blood is the Life. Book four. Realms of Stone. And now available. Book five. Realms of Fire. Available at skywatchtvstore.com. Paperback and Kindle at amazon.com. Characters you'll love and a story you can't put down. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. If it's Sunday night, this must be a view from the bunker. Well, yes, it is. Well, thank you for tuning in. I'm Derek Gilbert. Next Sunday night, the sons of God and the giants of old. Our friendly neighborhood PhD, Dr. Judd Burton, joins us to talk about the 7th Annual Sons of God Giants of Old Conference coming to Lubbock, Texas. That is Sunday, June 23rd, 2019, 7 p.m. Central Time, if you listen live, right here at VFTV. Net. Well, as I mentioned, my next book might just get the attention of the Council on American-Islamic Relations. And in fact, if they do pay attention to it and start protesting it, uh, that might actually help sales. Because uh, thankfully, that's been the one good outcome of uh, the protests directed at Raymond Ibrahim for Sword and Scimitar. The uh, rankings at Amazon spiked last week. Tell people, you cannot read this book, and immediately everybody wants to read the book. A um, lot of people, by the way, who see when CARE protests something or Linda Sarsour protests something and immediately assume that they're on the wrong side of the issue, which is usually quite honestly the case. My next book is called Bad Moon Rising, uh, Islam, Armageddon, and the Most Diabolical Double Cross in History. And uh, it is an examination of the spiritual forces behind Islam. It is necessarily speculative because we don't see into the spirit realm with 2020 vision, as Paul described it, it's like looking into a glass darkly. So, um, yeah, we're, we're not really, uh, going to know for sure what it is that, uh, is going on in the spirit realm. But to the best of my ability, I took a look at the gods worshiped in ancient Mesopotamia, specifically by the Amorites, because Quite honestly, Muhammad, when he introduced his religion in the 7th century, he kind of froze the Bedouin culture that was an outgrowth of Amorite culture from the days of Abraham. It had pretty much remained the same since about the 20th century BC, around the time Abraham was born. Through the 7th century AD, that culture was pretty much unchanged. I mean, there'd been a few upgrades in technology, but for the most part, the culture was really not that changed. And what Muhammad did was he turned it into a religion and kind of froze Arab culture in the 7th century. And groups like the Islamic State want to take us back there. So the question then becomes, who are they worshiping, and how are the characteristics of those deities manifest in in Islam? So anyway, that's the book. It's going to be out very soon. In fact, next week on Skywatch TV, beginning Sunday the 23rd, a series of four programs devoted to new books by me, Pastor Carl Gallops and Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis will begin to air on Skywatch TV, the nationally syndicated program. Uh, You can, of course, watch that uh, on the... the, If you watch it over the air, you can watch it on the regular networks, the Christian Television Network, uh, TCT, um, Victory Television Network in Arkansas, uh, a number of other places around the country. But, of course, if you've got the free Skywatch TV mobile app or if you've got the Skywatch TV channel on Roku, Apple TV, now on Amazon Fire TV as well, by the way. If you've got a Fire Stick, there's a Skywatch TV app that you can get for free from the Amazon App Store. And to watch the program that way on demand, it'll be available as of next Sunday, the 23rd, the first of four programs devoted to our books. Uh, Carl's new book is Gods of the Final Kingdom. And uh, Colonel McGinnis's new book, just in time for the 2020 election, called Progressive Evil. And you can guess what that one is about. So uh, some good conversations coming up on Skywatch TV. And uh, again, my new book, Bad Moon Rising, about the spiritual forces behind Islam and what role Islam will play in the end times. That's coming up on Skywatch TV over the next four weeks. (laughs) Uh, We are going to uh, 
be traveling a lot this uh, the, toward the end of summer and into fall. Uh, at least a couple of these conferences, thankfully, are just down the road from us in Branson, Missouri. The first annual Defender Conference from Skywatch TV, that's August 2nd through the 4th. Uh, that, of course, is sold out. Dr. Michael Heiser, Pastor Carl Gallops, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Dr. Michael Lake, Joel Richardson, Shelley Neese, author of the Copper Scroll Project, Josh Peck, Stephen Bankars, and more. And, of course, Sharon and I will be speaking as well. Jim and Lori Baker also speaking at the conference. And again, since it is sold out, you can't get a ticket at this point, but you still have plenty of time to get the sign up for the streaming video package. $79 gets you all of the presentations, including a question and answer session with Jim Barfield of the Copper Scroll Project and a live uh, recorded. It'll be recorded live anyway. You'll see these uh, presentations uh, roughly an hour and a half after the presentations. Uh, they're recorded first and uploaded to the web, so the stream's not interrupted by flaky hotel internet. Uh, you'll also see a live presentation of um, Paranormal, Mike Heiser's podcast, dealing with uh, peer-reviewed research into paranormal subjects. In fact, I've got to start reading those papers to get prepared for that. Uh, anyway, for information on signing up for the streaming video, log on to uh, DefenderConference.com. DefenderConference.com. Uh, the Sons of Old Gi- uh, Sons of God Giants of Old Conference, the following weekend, August 16th through the 18th, we'll see Mike Heiser there again. This is at the Fellowship in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, Dr. Judd Burton, Dr. Aaron Judkins, Dr. Gregory, a lot of doctors there. Dr. Greg Reed, Doug Hamp will be there as well. Sharon and I speaking. Uh, this is again August 16th through the 18th for information. And by the way, registration for the Sons of God Giants of Old Conference, only five bucks. Don't miss it. If you're anywhere near Lubbock, Texas, August 16th through 18th, the website for information is Beyond Burton, or rather Burton Beyond. That's it, BurtonBeyond.com. The True Legends Conference in Branson, September 13th through the 15th, Gen6.com for that. I will be the uh, Master of Ceremonies for that event, G-E-N-S-I-X.com. The theme, Answering the Alien Question. And then October 4th through 6th, the uh, Unsealed Scroll Prophecy Conference. Sharon and I speaking along with L.A. Marzulli, Jonathan Kahn, Bill Salas, Carl Gallops, Ryan Peterson, Paul McGuire, Billy Crone, Jim Barfield, and more. Music by John Schlitt. For information and to register, unsealedscroll.org, unsealedscroll.org, and use the promo code GILBERT20 to save 20%. And you can use that promo code the following weekend here the Watchmen, California, at the Hilton Irvine. That's October 11th through 13th. L.A. Marzulli, Russ Dizdar, Zev Parat, Josh Peck, Stephen Pankars, Gans, Shimura, Troy Anderson, Paul McGuire, and more. And again, that's uh, Sharon and me will be there. Gilbert 20, when you check out at hearthewatchmen.com to save 20%. Leave us a review. Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever else you find us. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.